Thank you, Simon. Good morning, dear listener. This is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties Radio with your breakfast show. Four minutes past six. Man, it was hard work getting up this morning. You, you don't know how close you came to not having a breakfast show. Are we allowed to do that? I, I, I'll find out if I'm actually allowed to just bunk off and cancel the whole show. Lots of stuff on this morning, and as always, uh, we need your input. I'm going to give out the phone numbers and the texts in just a few seconds, so go and get a pen and paper if you don't know already. First of all... After yesterday's show, where I declared that Daydream Believer was the best pop song in the world, huge argument in the office, huge argument in the office after the show yesterday. So today we're going to find it. We're going to find the best pop songs ever. We want to compile a top five of your top pop songs. And it doesn't matter how cheesy or embarrassing or ridiculous they are. You can text those in, please. Your top pop song. 81333. Start your text, 3CR. Also, now, I know this is going to be... (laughs) This is an odd question to be asking of you, but just just have a think about it. Have you ever been to an illegal rave? Yeah, I know, it's pushing it slightly of you, but you never know. There might be someone listening to this who's going, well, actually, back in 89, I was a bit of the raver. If you have, 08459 455 555. We're going to be talking about illegal raves in a bit. And also, the new unemployment figures are out. Unemployment is down, although there are more people getting job seekers allowance. I never quite understand how that works. We're going to be asking, is it easier to find a job now? How easy is it to find a job? Or are you struggling? 08459. Four double five, five double five. If anybody listening has tips on how people can improve their chances in finding a job, it'd be good to hear from you as well, because I know there'll be lots of people listening who are struggling. 08459 four double five, five double five is the telephone number. 81333 is the text. Start your text 3CR. You can email as well. 3CR at bbc.co.uk. Call 08459 455 555. 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. Let's start off nice and gently, shall we? Andrew Gold and Lonely Boy. Andrew Gold, Lonely Boy. Ten past six. Where are we? What day is it today? Is it Thursday? It is Thursday, isn't it? Thursday the 19th of July. The police and council in Bedfordshire are working together to crack down on illegal raves. It follows a rave in the Heath and Reach area held close to the A5 Flying Fox roundabout back in May. Locals complained about the noise and the fact that officers didn't seem to do enough. Well, with her glow sticks in hand, reporter Serena Serena Farrow met councillor Mark Vassalion at the field to see what all the fuss is about. So, this is it. It's quite a... Well, inconspicuous entrance, really, isn't it? Yeah, and so overgrown that, that it, you know, it's surprising that it occurred to somebody that that might be a good location. But you can see there's a wide open space behind this barn. Tucked down below, the hill kind of drops away, and down the gradient, there is a former quarry, which is now disused. Um, but next to that, there's a good four or five acres of grassland, including parking space. And indeed, there were many cars at this rave. Plus, it takes a while for people to figure out where the sound is coming from. Disused quarries, that seems to be a recurring theme. They weren't in the quarry. They were adjacent to it. But yeah, that is a recurring theme, isn't it? I suppose it's, they're guaranteed that it's a big open space, so they can have hundreds, if not thousands of people, if, if they wish. I mean, in, in the instance of my village, that wasn't the case. It was under 100 people. But yeah, it could have grown to a, to a much bigger rave. And that was the other area of concern that I've had and that I've conveyed to police and council officers, that when a rave starts, the police tell me it can grow very quickly. And what ought to happen is the police are present at the entrance to the rave as soon as possible to make sure it doesn't get bigger. Because then you've got public disturbance issues, manning issues. If you've got a 1,000 people, it's much harder to control and potentially stop that rave than if it's just 50 or 60 people. I mean, my first concern is for it not to happen again, 
particularly in the same place. We would all look very silly, wouldn't we, um, the police and the other authorities, if it happened again. It is a very covert location they've chosen. Mm. It took me ages to find the place. There must be a big group. Are they doing it perhaps on Facebook, things like that, or is it just word of mouth? I mean, that is typically how it's how it's done. In this instance, we don't know. This seems to have been an impromptu, more informal effort. So that in a way makes it harder, I suppose, for the police and the uh, local authority to pin down who's behind it. For me and the residents that I represent is that the villages and indeed some of the towns in central Bedfordshire are not randomly and and what seems to be consistently subjected in the summer to um, noise disturbance. But I know uh, in some instances, if only the organisers were spoken to from the police and or the authority, I think um, some of those raves could be addressed and could be mitigated. Certainly in my village with this rave in particular, the issue there was was that nothing appeared to be happening from you know the six hours between the, the organisers being spoken to and the rave finally stopping, that the rave continued at the same noise levels for that six or so hours. So there's a perception from the public and from myself as their representative that nothing was being done. And that's an issue for you because even if they'd have turned it down or something, it still would have been better than nothing. Absolutely, and, and you know, having had a number of conversations with council officers and police since this rave, I've been reassured that there are things that can be done to uh, reduce the sound levels. So, of course, changing frequencies, particularly of the bottom end, you know, it's the bass that everyone hears um, before anything else. Even changing the direction of the speakers can make a, a, a big difference. Thirdly, uh, particularly these informal type of raves, the organisers don't realise the sound is travelling a mile down into the village uh, and disturbing everyone at 4 a.m on a Sunday morning. I've had meetings, police are going to be uh, even more robust, but uh, you know we've taken another look at this and revised some of the practices and reactions that we make. So when a resident phones in to the noise pollution team, whether it's at the council or indeed to the police on 101, police will have a more well-oiled and practised response to that. Have you ever called the noise pollution team or the, the, I don't, is it environmental health, whoever? Have you ever done that? Had to call the council because there's been a rave or a party going on? that's really noisy. I'll be honest, my council are rubbish. Rubbish. A a few months ago, there was a house opposite us. They were having a massive party at half past four in the morning. Half past four in the morning. It was really loud. And I was, um, I was very annoyed, shall we say. I was upset. And I called the council. They went, ah, yeah, not a lot we can do about it. I went, what? Can't you send, send the, I called the police. The police said, call the council. I called the council. They said, call the police. Called the police. They said, no, you have to call the council. I called the council and they said, well, there's not really a lot we can do about it. I said, well, can't you send someone out? They said, oh, no, everyone's gone home. They go home at four. If you'd have called before four, we could have sent someone out. If you call after nine, we can send someone out. What use is that? So between the, the hours of four in the morning and nine in the morning, you can make as much noise as you want. Incredible. Oh, wait, four five nine four double five five double five. Beds, hearts and bugs news. BBC Three Counties Radio. These are your headlines this morning on BBC Three Counties Radio on Thursday, July the 19th. The Hertfordshire woman has backed her son's decision to refuse a fresh medical test to see if he's fit to be extradited to the USA. Gary McKinnon, who has Asperger's syndrome, is accused of hacking into Pentagon and NASA computers, but insists he was looking for evidence of UFOs. The Metropolitan Police have charged five people with terrorism offences. Three men are accused of travelling to Pakistan for training in terrorism. A fourth man and a woman are suspected of having possessed documents likely to be useful to a terrorist. In sport, Stevenage lost 2-0 at home to Tottenham in last night's friendly in front of over 5,000 fans at the Lamex Stadium. We'll have a full weather bulletin in a few minutes. Coming up, is it easier to get a job now? After 6.30, we'll find out about a new job club being launched in Luton to help people back into employment. By the way, I think it's Stoke Poges, not Stoke Pogues. Anyway, good morning. This is Ian Lee on BBC Three, Three Counties uh, Radio. Um, it'd be nice to talk to you if you want to give me a call. 08459 455 555. Or you can text in. This is what I'd like you to text in about, actually. We are trying to find the top five pop songs. It's, it's pop. So kind of rock and all those other things. Uh, you can try and slip them in under the radar, but if they're too rocky, I might have to exclude them. I'll be honest, it's not a scientific survey. I, uh, me and my team will be the judges on this. So it might be slightly biased, but I, if you can text in with your favourite pop song of all time, I just want one from you. 
OK? 81333. Start your text 3CR. We will announce the top five, compiled by you, the three counties breakfast, li- breakfast listeners, at the end of the show. Here are some to kind of get you in the mood and give you an idea of what we've been thinking about. The first one was not suggested by me. Never gonna give you up, never gonna let you down. There's your winner. Daydream Believer, the monk, that's the winner. I mean, we know that's the winner, isn't it? So this is what we're after this morning. We want your suggestions for the best pop song of all time. You can only send in one. OK, I'm going to be strict about this. So if you send in more than one, I'm going to go for the first one that you've texted in. We are going to compile the top five... Um, songs, and then we'll write to the artists and tell them. <laughs> They'll be well chuffed. <laughs> you can text that in now, 81333, start your text 3CR. Beds, hearts and bugs, weather. BBC Three Counties Radio. Jim Bacon, before you go into the weather, please, what's your favourite pop song of all time? Well, I, I, I can remember the first one I bought as, on. a, as a single, which was Heard It Through the Grapevine by Marvin Gaye, and now, I still as, love that. As a now. first single, Jim, that's not bad, that's pretty good. That's pretty full on. Isn't it? My first single was a song called La Dolce Vita by Ryan Paris. Talk I, about rubbish. I don't think I know. No, you're, you're best not to know it. Well, oh. okay. Go, go, heard it through the grapevine. Excellent choice. Jim, what's happening in the weather? Jim, thank you very much. Call 08459 455 555. 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. Computer hacker Gary McKinnon has refused to have a fresh medical test needed to see if he's fit to be extradited. Experts say there's a high-risk Mr McKinnon who has Asperger's syndrome could kill himself if extradited, but ministers want a new report. Gareth Lloyd is here to tell us more. Can you remind me, Gareth, of the history of this case? Uh, Well, well, this has been going on now for ten years. Gary McKinnon, who's 46, is accused of hacking into American computers. Uh, Now, he faces up to 60 years in jail for hacking into Pentagon and NASA computers. That was between uh, about... February 2001 and March 2002. Now, he doesn't deny doing it, but insists he was looking for evidence of UFOs. Uh, The Home Secretary, Theresa May, has to make a final decision as to whether Mr McKinnon should be extradited. Uh, Gary's mum, Janice, uh, who lives in Hertfordshire, says now he's had four medical examinations. She says he was deemed an extreme on suicide risk and unfit for trial. Is this really ten years? That seems incredible. It's been going on a a long time. What's been decided about this new medical Medical examination. Oh, well, well, the High Court gave Gary a, a two-week deadline, which which ends today, to decide whether to have another examination to see if he's fit to be extradited. Uh, Gary's mum, Janice, says that he won't have the test because the test wouldn't be carried out by someone who can diagnose suicide risk mm. in people who have Asperger's or autism. Uh, she wants the Home Office to accept the findings of the examinations, which they've already found him to be unfit for this trial. So what happens next? Well, the Home Secretary has to make the final decision on whether Gary McKinnon should be extradited. Uh, Mr McKinnon's lawyer has told us that uh, Gary is confident that the Secretary of State will reach a fair and just decision. Uh, Later on, we'll hear from his mum, who's from Hertfordshire, Janice, there. Uh, She's been campaigning for ten years to stop him from being extradited. It's going to be fascinating talking to her. Thank you very much, Gareth. We'll uh, hear more on that story. I'm I'm shocked by ten years. Isn't it amazing how these, these things kind of come around? That's incredible. Well, we, we will be speaking to um, Gary's mum later on to uh, get her side of the story. Oh eight four five nine four double five five double five is the telephone number. Let's have a little bit of this, shall we? It's knee drums. Hey, hey, hey. It is. Listen, it's knee drums. Love it. I forget how good Buddy Holly is, and then I hear a Buddy Holly song go, man, he's good. I'm declaring uh, the Lee household is having a Buddy Holly day today when I get home. I'm introducing my little boy. We're asking for your favourite pop songs of all time as we compile the ultimate top five list of pop songs. And we've got Liz in Bulldog. Good morning, Liz. Hi there, morning. Good morning. What's your favourite pop song of all time? Oh, well, I rather like Gloria. 
Laura Branigan. Oh, <laughs> that was the funny. I think Jonathan played that um, <laughs> earlier in the week. Yeah, it's a real... Belter. I was. Uh, I dri- love it. I was. Dri- I forgot about that, and I was driving around the M25, yeah. and that came on on Jonathan's show, and I um, was having a right old sing along to that. Yeah, it's wonderful, isn't it? Uh, well, you know, it really makes me feel <laughs> ten years younger. <laughs> well, uh, listen, have, have a listen, uh, Liz. This is this is what you're talking about. That's oh, it's great. Sing along, Liz. <laughs> Not lightly. Oh, come on. No, I'd close you down. No, well, then we don't want to do that. Is <laughs> Liz, there anything else you called in about? Yeah, OK, environmental health. OK, do you mind if Gloria plays underneath, or is that inappropriate? I don't... doesn't bother me at all. Excellent, OK. OK. <laughs> Go on. OK, environmental health. Yes. I popped into one of the very large supermarkets, went down to the fresh counter, stood there asking for something, trudging towards me, came Mr Ratty. Oh, we're stopping, we're stopping, Gloria, to hear that. Oh, it no. A very large Mr Ratty. Now, there's a young lad standing there working on the Saturday. Down comes Mr Ratty. Yes. Mr Ratty stops behind him, sniffs, oh. looks up and down and disappears down a drain. I oh. I did a jump, please. I shot around the store shouting, rats, rats, we've got rats. Oh my goodness, Liz, that's an awful thing to see. Yeah. And did you did you go and speak to the manager or anything? Well, I think they the manager caught up with me because yeah. they wanted to shut me up. And he, uh, he said to me, <laughs> show me, show me where I understand it that feeling, Liz. Yes, sir. I said, OK. And I went to show him and he said, you can't go behind there, you haven't got a white coat on. And I said, neither did Mr. <laughs> Russell, but he went down there. <laughs> you can't go behind there. Yeah, anyway. Oh dear, I, I did. environmental health. Bear in mind it was a Saturday, but it was a rat. Yep. They rang me on the Monday, and that mm. partic- those shops are open. Well, they're open for a long time. Don't give us any clues yeah. as to what as to what that shop is. No, we're not no, in trouble. Well, not. Liz, listen, thank you very much. We did uh, mention on the back of the illegal rapes, ever had to call the council or the environmental health or to complain about noise or now to complain about rats. And it turns out you call them on a Saturday, they can't do anything until the Monday. Incredible. If you've got a story like that, thank you for that, Liz, and thank you for being a good sport. 08459 four double five five double five. This is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties Radio. Good morning, dear listener. It's 6.34. Uh, is it becoming easier to get a job? <laughs> Figures announced yesterday show unemployment has fallen for a fourth month in a row. The number of people out of work fell by 65,000 in the three months to May, according to the Office for National Statistics. However, and this is the bit I can't quite get my head around, there's still been a rise in the number of people claiming job seekers' allowance. Here in Luton, a new job club is being launched next week to help people in the Marsh Farm area back into employment. Our reporter Simon Watts has been to find out more. The economy remains fragile, but the latest unemployment statistics should offer up some hope for people who are out of work. But are those figures a fair reflection of the struggles people are facing while trying to find paid positions today? Just last month, the charity Shelter named Luton as a UK repossession hotspot, and their research linked that to a rise in unemployment. Well, as of Tuesday next week, Marsh Farm Futures, in partnership with Luton Borough Council, are launching a new job club aimed at helping 16 to 19-year-olds back into work. Ishak Kazi is the project development manager responsible for it and he joins us today. Firstly, Ishak, have you seen an increase in job opportunities in the last year or are those unemployment figures slightly distorted? Well, in my experience, I would say there does appear to be more opportunities in, in the marketplace and I think it's a question of finding out more about in, more information about them, where they are and identifying organisations that can actually put you in touch with organisations that are actually offering the job opportunities. It's important to recognise that whilst the rest of the nation may well be hooked on unemployment employment and, and depression, a real opportunity that may be available locally. And that's where the Job Club comes in. It's launching on Tuesday of next week. Tell us uh, what that will be all about. The purpose of this Job Club is essentially help young people between the ages of 16 to 19 year old who are not in education, employment or training of any kind. And we are here with some professional uh, personal advisors, they're called PAs, who can actually give you a hands-on support and advice on finding the job for you. And if it's not a job that looking for if you're looking for uh, some training program they will also help around that Uh, any issue relating to learning job and training that we'll be able to help you so will there be professional skills tools or is this more a case of somebody coming to you and saying i want to 
get into an industry where I could work as a carpenter or a plumber or something like that, and then they will, will show you and point you in the right direction? Well, yes, uh, partly that, but more specifically, they will be able to provide advice, and they will advise you what is the best way of getting into the particular area that you want to pursue. Organisations that you can get in touch, or they will facilitate that, provide you with some hands-on practical support in the building itself. And in the building, we will also have opportunities for other providers. For example, Job Centre Plus will be here, and they will be here every t- Thursday all day, and they can be given support and help from them as well. And how important is it to give particularly young people here in Luton some direction, something to aim for? For example, in, in our particular area, almost 20-25% of the local people in that age category are not in employment or education or training. So that's a huge resource of people that is not being productive. What we really aim to do is help young people become more involved in the local economy by improving their skills, their ideas, helping them to think about things like self-employment and starting their own business. Sometimes people think, oh, it's all doom and gloom, but these are the, sometimes are the right times to start your own business. Without the aim or an ambition, it's very difficult to get up in the morning when you're not working. It's interesting. I was wondering, have you found it easier to get a job recently? Have you been struggling for a while and get a job? It's interesting what the guy was saying there about starting your own business, because starting your own business is tough, isn't it? And also, banks aren't particularly lending, I would have thought, and I could be wrong, and if I am wrong on this, let me know, but it would appear that banks aren't particularly lending to companies that are starting new businesses. How how have you found it? Have you started a new business and been given money to do it? Have you managed to get a job recently, or are you struggling? 08459 455 555. Or you can text 81333, start your text 3CR. You can email 3cr at bbc.co.uk. We'll speak to you after Spandau Ballet. Good morning, dear listener. This is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio, your breakfast show through till nine o'clock when Jonathan comes in and takes over. You can give me a call any time you want. 08459 455 555. Have you had trouble finding a job or have you found it easier in the last few months? Apparently it's getting easier. That's what we're being told. That's what the figures would say. Or if someone could explain how the number of unemployed has gone down, but the number of people claiming job seekers has gone up. I can't, I can't quite get my head around that. 08459 455 555. Have you found it easier getting a job recently? Or is it as, as tough as it's always been? Uh, and we had a guy on just then talking about starting your own business. That's got to be tough, isn't it? Where, where are you going to get the money from? Banks aren't lending any money, are they? Beds, hearts and bugs news. BBC Three Counties Radio. The headline, headlines this morning on BBC Three Counties Radio. A Hertfordshire woman has backed her son's decision to refuse a fresh medical test to see if he's fit to be extradited to the USA. Gary McKinnon, who has Asperger's syndrome, is accused of hacking into the Pentagon and NASA computers, but he insists he was looking for evidence of UFOs. The Metropolitan Police have charged five people with terrorism offences. Three men are accused of travelling to Pakistan for training in terrorism. A fourth man and a woman are suspected of having possessed documents likely to be useful to a terrorist. In sport, the Open Golf Championship starts this morning at Royal Lytham, with Buckinghamshire's world number one Luke Donald aim- again aiming to win his first major. And your weather across beds, hearts and bucks. Bright spells at first, but otherwise rather cloudy, with the chance of some showery rain developing. Maximum temperature 18 degrees Celsius. Coming up after seven, we talk more about illegal raves and hear from a Bedfordshire rave group about how the council and the p- police respond towards late night music events. What do you reckon? We were talking earlier on about this. If, this is a long shot, but I'm prepared to have a go. If you've ever been to an illegal rave... Oh, wait, 459 four, double, five, five, double, five. I know that the listeners of uh, BBC Three Counties, it's pushing it a little bit, but I thought we'd ask. Perhaps more pertinent to you and your situation, uh, have you ever had to call Environmental Health or the council because of noise or something like that going on? I had great difficulty when there was a party in the house opposite me, half past four in the morning. Get this, it was half past four in the morning, okay? And it was just ridiculous. They were singing along. We had someone mention, heard it through the grapevine. They were singing along to that really loudly. 
No, it, was, it wasn't that. It was Dock of the Bay, sitting in the Dock of the Bay, really loudly, being sung along by a load of drunken idiots at half past four in the morning. I called up the council, and they went, well, I'm afraid if there's nobody in from that department. If you'd have called before four, we could have sent someone around. Otherwise, you'll have to call after nine, nine a.m. So what? So they can make as much noise as they want between four and nine. And then, get this, the council phoned me back at quarter past five to say they couldn't do anything. And I said, I know, you told me that 45 minutes ago. Why on earth are you phoning me up? Rant over. Uh, if you've ever had to call the council because of noise, 08459 455 555, how did they deal with it? And we're asking, is it easier to get a job now? We're compiling the um, uh, unofficial BBC Three Counties Radio top five pop songs. Uh, and we're asking you to text those in, 81333, start your text, 3CR. This is after yesterday's show, where I declared that Daydream Believer, was by the Monkees, was the best pop song of all time. There was um, th- th- fury in the office afterwards. All kinds of abuse I was getting for suggesting that. Well, we're going to compile the top five. So far, we've got Gloria, Laura Branigan, uh, on the texts. Now, I'm, my finger is kind of on old pop music. Uh, there's two songs here I don't know. Stephen the Melko says it's got to be the one and only Janet Kay with Silly Games. I have no idea what that song is. Can someone call up and just sing me a little bit of that? 08459 455 555. Who's going to be brave at nearly ten minutes to seven and phone up and sing me a little bit of Silly Games by Janet Kay? And also, Walk Right Now by the Jacksons. Now, Alan in Chesson is obviously a fan, a big fan of this song. He says, Ian, my favourite song of all time is Walk Right Now by the Jacksons. Rarely played on radio. Justin Dealey played it a year ago. <laughs> He's logged when it's been played. If you can phone up and sing just a little bit, it's a snatch of one of those two songs. Walk Right Now by the Jacksons or Silly Games by Janet Kay. 08459 455 555. I'd, l- I'd love you forever if you could. I've never heard them. Speak to you after this, Kelly Clarkson, Dark Side. She's not on the list. We've had a couple more suggestions for the best pop song of all time. I, I don't know. How strict am I going to be? I don't know if I can include these for various reasons. But the main reason is I'm not sure they're pop songs. Tuesday Wild Child, Bohemian Rhapsody, Queen. It's, it's not a pop song. Also, a little bit overrated, do you think? Do you listener? Could it be? I'm not going to include that one. I'm, Tuesday, I, I'm specifically looking for pop songs, unless people text in and abuse me, in which case I might. 81333. It's like your text 3CR. And then Joe says, Dire Straits, Money for Nothing. That's not quite so rocky. I, do you know what? I'm going to include Dire Straits. Controversially, I'm not including Queen, Bohemian Rhapsody. We want to find the top five pop songs of all time. And it's uh, pop, I think, specifically. We can do rock another day. Uh, but pop specifically, 81333 is the text number. Start your text, 3CR. Later on in the show, now here's something you can maybe call in about, if you can get to a phone. Uh, we talked yesterday about how the text is replacing the phone call, and less and less people are actually making phone calls uh, in favour of texts. And we had a couple of uh, callers um, about phone boxes in their area. Who still uses phone boxes? We're going to do a little report later on about phone boxes and uh, uh, about them. Have you got a phone box near you? Has your phone box been taken down, dismantled? Uh, When was the last time you used a phone box and why? 08459 455 555. If you can call us for a phone box, you get double points. When was the last time you used a phone box and why? 08459 455 555. Now, another day and more criticism of security firm G4S from politicians. The Labour uh, leader, Ed Miliband, says G4S should be barred from taking on any more government contracts to provide police support services until there's been a review into its competence. Hertfordshire Police is considering using G4S as part of its link up with the Hertfordshire. Sorry, Bedfordshire Police is considering G4S as part of its uh, link up with the Hertfordshire and Cambridgeshire forces. Meanwhile, the Commons Public Accounts Committee has warned in a report that the government needs to get a grip on G4S to ensure the Olympic Games run smoothly. Its chairman, Labour MP Margaret Hodge, says the chaos of recent days had been predictable and had undermined confidence in the Olympic Games organisers. Our reporter, Lisa Costello, has been looking into this. Good morning, Lisa. 
Good morning. Now, it seems like bad news just keeps coming for G4S at the moment. Yeah, misery on misery, really, since last week, when, of course, it became clear that 3,500 troops were going to have to be drafted in to cover these holes in the company's recruitment for the Games. But then, of course, on Tuesday, we all remember the firm's chief executive, Nick Buckles, forced to admit before the Home Affairs Select Committee that the whole business was a humiliating shambles for the company. And now, of course, today's report from the Public Accounts Committee increasing that pressure, Ed Miliband's comments you mentioned in your introduction, and, of course, the committee actually saying quite explicitly that G4 shouldn't just cover the extra costs created by their failures, but that they should actually be fined for their non-delivery as well. Now, uh, the chair of this committee, the Labour MP, Margaret Hodge, is very critical of both G4S and LOCOG about this. She says there are questions to be answered by LOCOG about the 12-fold hike in management costs from £10 million to £125 million, but that the real problem here seems to have been a lack of transparency. Let's have a listen to what she says. The Olympic Delivery Authority delivered on time in budget. It was an open contract by a public organisation, totally transparent. Here we have a private company, Locock, making a, a contract with a private, other private company, G4S, and it's all very hidden. And I think that lack of transparency has led to some of the problems we're experiencing today. That's Margaret Hodge. Has there been an official government response to this latest criticism? Well, the Culture Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, has issued a statement in response uh, to this criticism. He's rejected uh, the points made by the committee. He insists there'll be no extra cost, firstly, to the taxpayer because of all of this. He says things are on track, uh, that a great games will be delivered uh, and it will be delivered under budget. He rejects the criticism of the lack of transparency in, in the dealings of the Department of Culture, Media and Sport. He says that is not the case. And he also says and points out that uh, delivering the London Games is a huge undertaking. He says it's bigger than any other logistical operation in peacetime. He says that uh, the department isn't complacent about that, but that he thinks that uh, their preparations will bear comparison with any other Olympic city uh, at this point in the past. It does raise some serious questions about how such important services are outsourced, doesn't it? It does indeed, and as you, as you mentioned, Ed Miliband saying that G, G4S should be banned from, from any other contracts until that there is a, an inquiry, and we're likely to hear more from uh, the Labour leader uh, later on today. He's due to give a speech, and he's going to urge the government to think again about plans for outsourcing police services, more police services, to private companies after what's happened with G4S. Uh, he says there should be tougher procurement rules, uh, and of course many might point out, well hang on a minute, Labour uh, first championed this idea idea after all when it was in power uh, but Mr Miliband is likely to say that at that stage they were only talking about backroom jobs, things like IT services for example that sort of thing, not frontline core services and he'll say today that the scandal as he calls it over G4S and Olympic security is proof that that shouldn't happen. Lisa thank you very much our reporter Lisa Costello there <laughs> Seven o'clock on the nose. Coming up in the next hour, we're still trying to find your top five pop songs. Illegal raves. Gary McKinnon. And how easy is it to find a job? All that and more after the latest news and sport with Simon Oxley. Thank you, Simon. Good morning. This is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties Radio Breakfast. I'm here for, hang on, this week and then two weeks after that. So, um, <clears throat> you haven't got that long to put up with me. Uh, if you want to give me a call this morning on any of the things we're talking about, you'd be more than welcome to. Illegal Raves coming up. Not on the radio, obviously, that would be inappropriate. Uh, Gary McKinnon, we're going to be talking to his local MP, or his mum's local MP, and his mum as well, a bit later on, to find out the latest that's going on there. But I think the main thrust of the uh, show this morning is we are trying to find the top five pop songs of all time. I think that's kind of the most important theme today. Would you agree? Yes. I'd agree. I'd agree. Uh, if you want to tell us your favourite pop song, and it's got to be a pop song, I've had to drop, I've dropped Bohemian Rhapsody, that's not in there. 81333. You can text those in. 81333. Start your text, 3CR. I'm still waiting for someone to call in and sing Silly Games by Janet Kay. Never heard of it. Never even heard of it. If you want to give me a call about any of the other things, we're talking as well about how difficult is it to find a job. Government figures say that the uh, numbers... Oh, we might have a caller on Silly Games. Oh, that's exciting. How exciting. We'll go to Susan in a minute then. Government figures say the number of unemployed has dropped, but the number of people claiming job seekers allowance has gone up. How does that work? 
Am I, am I being stupid? I don't get, I don't get it. 08459 455 555. You can call me today about any of the things that we're talking about. Uh, or any of the things, and this is important, any of the things you think we should be uh, talking about. 08459 455 555. Call 08459 455 555. 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. That's where we are, and that's the number. Excellent stuff indeed. Uh, and someone has called in. I was talking because someone uh, voted for the song Silly Games by Janet Kay. I had never, ever heard of it. Susan's called in. Good morning, Susan. Good morning. You know this song, do you? Know it well. well um, it's a lover's rock song. It comes under the genre of lover's rock. I didn't know was... there was a genre of lover's rock. Yeah. It, it was very popular in the 1970s to 1980s, and it got, got to number two in the charts. But the remarkable thing is, is yeah. that, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a reggae DJ. Okay. So if I play that on a Saturday night, it still has the same response it had back in the 1970s. Really? Yeah, it got to number two and it was really, really popular. Well, Susan, I'm going to have to ask you a, a question that you may not want me to ask, but could you sing me some, please? Could I send you the song? Sing me some. <laughs> I don't know it! Come on, you can't tease me! <laughs> oh, silly games. No, yeah. my voice is terrible. Oh, listen, Susan, no one, no one cares about your voice. I guess, I've literally got no idea what it is. You can't tease me by saying that you know it and then not give me a little piece, please. Oh, so silly games, but the thing is... <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, good sport. Well done. You, 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 you almost had a go, yeah. OK. But, uh, but, and uh, you want to talk about illegal raves as well, do you? Yeah, I mean, that was another thing that was quite popular back then as well. Mm. But, um, you know, you'd g- we never used to think of them as being illegal, but you'd go to... Well, it was a house party back a then. house party, yes, of yeah, course. Yeah, and then you'd just go and sometimes you'd pay at the door, sometimes you'd pay for the drink, sometimes you got in free. Yeah. I mean, more recently, they do have them. But once again, I think the people who are holding them, they're the ones that are doing it illegally. But the people who go there don't really think, oh, it's an illegal rave. So you go there, you know you can go there about three or four o'clock in the morning. Right. But not, so, not out in the park, though. They're normally in warehouses and stuff in London. So the punters that are going, they don't know it's illegal. They think it's a legitimate night that's been put yeah, on. Yeah, because you get the posters, you get the flyers, yeah. you get everything as though it's illegal. I mean, you wouldn't think it's illegal. Right. Because, you know, you're just going to a place and you're paying your money and you're going in like you would go to a nightclub. Mm. The, the only reason why it's illegal is because it's not in an official nightclub. You see what I mean? You don't go to these things, do you, Susan? I do sometimes, occasionally. OK, because I, I want to tread around this as gently as I can, but I would the fact that you're remembering songs from the 70s and you, you use the phrase <laughs> house parties, you know where I'm going and I have to go there, Susan, it would imply that you are of a certain generation. Yes, I am. Shall we say. <laughs> you're too old to be going to these things, you silly oh, sausage. Oh, no, the age is but a number, please. <laughs> Listen, I'm, I'm 39. Uh, I'm, I'm practising saying I'm nearly 40, so next year I'm, I'm, like, I'm ready for it. But, I, I, you know, I was... <laughs> it's funny doing this job because uh, I was in bed last night at 8.30. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, but the thing is, even if I wasn't doing this job, I would probably have been in bed by about 8.30. But it gives me the... Now I'm, I'm up at silly o'clock, it gives me the excuse, oh, I've, I've got to be up at 4 o'clock, so I have to go to bed. But I quite... I'm an old man. I like going to bed, reading, listening to a little bit of Radio 4. Susan, you, this is what you should be doing. Oh, no, you'd be surprised. People in my age group, from the 50s to about 70 or 80s, are filling these places and raving all night wow. till early hours of the morning. <laughs> Susan, listen, thank you so much for calling, and thank you for being a good sport. I want to speak to a 70-year-old raver. Now, Su- Susan has set the, the benchmark there. If you notice, I didn't ask her age. I wouldn't do that. But she has said herself that 70 or 80-year-olds are going to raves. <clears throat> really? Oh, wait, four, five, nine. Four double five five double five. I'd be surprised, but I'd also be very, very keen to speak to you. Uh, unless we know, we know, silly games is a real song. It exists. It's on the list now. So far, the lists we've got that I've allowed through Gloria uh, by Laura Branigan. I just looked Laura Branigan up. I was wondering where she was. She passed away in two thousand and four, I think it was. Silly games, Janet Kay. Walk right now, the Jacksons. Oh, Mark from Hemel can tell me about walk right now. Can you, Mark? Hello, Ian. How are you doing, fella? I'm all right. This is another song that oh, I've never heard of. Mate. Absolutely brilliant song. How does it go? 
Right, I'll, I'll tell you a bit of background on it, if you like, first, mate. Give me a little bit of background. Oh, he's he's got to sing it as right, well. Um, okay. Yeah, it was, it was taken off the 1981 album by the Jacksons called Triumph. Um, it was released after Can You Feel It? You must know that one. Can You Feel It? It's a fantastic yeah. song. And the great video where they're giants. After. Yeah, that's it, that's it. It was the next one after that. Um, he wrote it in between um, writing the albums off the war and thriller, so it was that stage of his career. So it was when, it was when he was good? Oh, yeah, yeah, ma- yeah. massive, you know. Um, and then I, I think it was it was definitely a top ten hit, but it's, it's my favourite pop song of all time, because it's just, it's just him to a T. Well, g- g- let's, have, let's have a bit, come on. Right, I, I'm trying to do a bit of justice, mate, so you'll have to forgive me. <laughs> Listen, right, um, you, heard, you heard the last caller, let's be honest, she was lovely, she wasn't great, so... All right, then, mate, you I, can I, beat I, that. I'll give it a go, then. Uh, I know our love couldn't last forever Persuade your way, but you ain't clever I close the door and I say never I don't care what you're saying Walk right now, you, I'm staying Love elsewhere for you, I'm praying. Don't look back, you ain't staying. Walk right now, I uh, am yeah. praying. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, listen, you you were giving it some, then you were giving it some welly. Well, I, I, I am a big fan, mate, and I like to do him justice, you know what I mean? Are yeah, you a little bit great. of a karaoke king? Uh, I am, actually, yeah. yeah I thought so, <laughs> I thought so, because you were putting the little wobble in your voice. I'm broken as well, mate, standing by me van. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, listen, you've been a good sport. Thank you very much for that. There we go. 08459 four double five five double five. Well, th- th- that means the Jackson song, Walk Right Now, which sounded superb. I was trying to add a little bit of echo on him, but I couldn't quite work out the echo machine on here. There is one, and I'm going to learn that for future use. Walk right, Walk right Now by the Jacksons is number one. That's, that's number one in our list, I think. The fact that we've had two people phoning in for it, well, one text, one call, and we had a, a superb performance from Mark. I was kind of rocking out then. Uh, now, we were due to speak to uh, Gary McKinnon's uh, local MP um, about the latest in his case. We can't get hold of him, unfortunately, so we'll, we'll put that to one side for a little bit later on. We are going to speak to Gary McKinnon's mum a bit later on, so do stay tuned for that, because it's going to be fascinating. Uh, I think, well, we've got time, I think, to have a quick look through the front pages of the papers, because I didn't do that in the first hour, which is a shame, and I'm terribly sorry about that. Uh, the Times. War reaches Assad. Damascus volcano erupts as rebel bomb kills hardliners, including President's brother-in-law. Uh, this is the uh, the story that the war in Syria, and it, it is a war, isn't it? You can skirt around all these kind of different terms and stuff. It's a war. There's a civil war going on. Uh, it's getting closer to Assad. President Assad. It's an incredible story. Um, the Guardian has the same story. Bomber strikes at Assad's elite. Three key allies killed in Dismas- Damascus. Rumour that President's wife has fled Syria. Uh, and there's something there about the, um, uh, the, the opening ceremony for the Games. There's controversy because the opening ceremony has had to be cut slightly so that everyone can get home in time. The Daily Telegraph. Cameron. Os- oh, my goodness gracious me. Cameron. Austerity will last until 2012. Prime Minister admits he cannot see a time when spending will not have to be cut. Uh, the Tetra Pak billionaire hands Christian Rousing in court. Border staff threaten strike chaos before the Games. And motorists to be hit with tolls on existing highway. Motorists face paying tolls. Tolls? Tolls. 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 Never know how to say it. Tolls? Tolls. It sounds different in my head. Uh, on existing stretch of road in Britain for the first time. Oh, fantastic. That's all we need, isn't it? That's all we need. Let me just do the independent, and then we'll get the travel, and we'll go to the other ones a little bit later on. Well, it's the, it's the same thing, isn't it? The independent. Damascus, a bomb strikes at the, height, uh, at the heart of the Assad regime. The opposition dealt a devastating strike to the jugular of the Syrian uh, regime yesterday as a bomb blast ripped through a meeting room where senior national security advisers were assembled, killing at least three of Bashar al-Assad's innermost circle. And UK's nuclear deterrent... This is an interesting story. UK's nuclear deterrent may be mothballed to save million, billions. Britain's nuclear weapon system will be put on standby and reactivated at short notice under a plan favoured by the Liberal Democrats. It does... Here's a question for you. You can answer this if you want. Oh, wait, four five nine four double five five double five. Do we need nuclear weapons in this country? Billions and billions of pounds. And we're making cuts everywhere. Do we need them? Hasn't war evolved to the point where they're kind of redundant? 
Just a thought. 08459 four double five five double five. Beds, hearts and bugs news. BBC Three Counties Radio. These are your headlines this morning on Thursday, July the 19th on BBC Three Counties Radio. A Hertfordshire woman has backed her son's decision to refuse a fresh medical test to see if he's fit to be extradited to the USA. Experts say there's a high risk he could kill himself if extradited to America, but ministers want a new report. The Metropolitan Police have charged five people with terrorism offences. Three men are accused of travelling to Pakistan for training in terrorism. A fourth man and a woman are suspected of having possessed documents likely to be useful to a terrorist. In sport, Stevenage lost 2-0 at home to Tottenham in last night's friendly in front of over 5,000 fans at the Lamex Stadium. We've got a full sports bulletin in 15 minutes. There'll also be a full weather bulletin in a few minutes. And coming up, for the fourth month running, unemployment figures have fallen. So is it easier to get a job now? Or are those figures deceptive? We'll talk more about that after 7.30. Always worth a listen to, to Nick from Midday. And don't forget, of course, from 9 o'clock, uh, you've got Jonathan Vernon-Smith. Uh, I'm reading your text and scribbling notes away. I'm, I'm, I'm updating the top five um, pop songs of all time. Tuesday Wildchild, who um, texted in earlier with Bohemian Rhapsody, is furious. Furious! She's texted back. 813-33, starting her text, 3CR. By the way, if you're sending in a text, it's Ian, it's I-A-I-N. Uh, it's, it's a small thing. I just spell it properly. You know, I spell it properly. Um, Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody sold nearly how many noughts are there? One million copies in five weeks. Five weeks, which makes it very pop, Eula, as in pop music. Tuesday, if I get another text from someone else asking for Bohemian Rhapsody, I'll put it in. But y- you sending two texts, I can't do that. It's a rock song. Uh, Jez in High Wickham, may God bless you, Jez. Unanimously, the all-time number one pop song has to be Daydream Believer by the Monkees. They're a legend, and that song is one of my all-time favourite karaoke songs. Jez, thank you. That means I can officially put it in the list now. If it had just been my vote, wouldn't have been allowed to put it in the list, but um, I can. Also, Alan in Chesham. Nothing wrong with the monkeys, Ian. When the Beatles went into fantasy land with the I Am The Walrus, the monkeys kept it real. Keep it real. Big up yourself, monkeys. Thank you. Alan uh, also says, Queen did good songs. The opera one was awful. (laughs) Yeah, the opera one was awful. Queen, I kind of have a love-hate relationship with them. Sometimes I like them, and sometimes I think, oh, you're a bit silly. Bohemian Rhapsody, I think, is a little bit silly. Seven Seas of Rye is a good song, and um, uh, Bicycle Race is a good song. But the the rest, I'm not sure. Did I tell you I I had uh, Brian May playing guitar for me in his garage once? Did I tell you that? It's true. I went to his garage. We're filming a documentary about Vox Amps. Went to his garage to interview him, and he's playing his guitar. I'm like, Brian, what happens if you um, change the pickups, if you flick the switch on that guitar? He goes, oh, if you put these two pickups together, that's the Bohemian Rhapsody sound. Then he started playing Bohemian Rhapsody. I was this close to him. It's incredible. I'm not Queen fan, but that was incredible. Uh, here's a good one. Yes, I'll have this. I can't listen to this band for various reasons. It remi- You know, there are, this is something we should do maybe next week. You know there are bands and there are songs that you just can't listen to because they remind you of something or someone or a period in your life when things weren't going right. Well, Bob, this, I can't listen to the Scissor Sisters because it just, it just takes me to a place that I'm not comfortable being. But uh, yes, I'll give you that. I don't feel like dancing by the Scissor Sisters. That's, that's a great pop song. We will put that on the list. And Lexi in St Albans. We're talking about illegal raves. I do, I do like doing this job because you get such a wide range of people getting in touch and it's wonderful. I'm 73. I'd love to know where these raves are. Rock on! <laughs> Lexi in St Albans. 08459. Uh, I've forgotten the phone number for a second. Look, brain freeze. 08459 455. 555 is the telephone number if you, you want to give me a call at any point. And I, I, texts are fine and fantastic and I do enjoy them. But I, I do prefer the phone. It's much nicer to talk to you. And then we get people like Mark phoning up and singing us obscure Jackson songs that um, are a little bit odd, which I love. 08459 455 555 is the phone number. You can also uh, text if you want, 81333, start your text, 3CR. This is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties Radio. I'm having fun this morning. Having lots and lots of fun this morning, which is always a joy. Beds, hearts and bugs, weather. BBC Three Counties Radio. And the fun's about to increase tenfold because Jim Bacon is going to give us some excellent weather news, aren't you, Jim? <laughs> well, I wish. Jim. Um, OK, all right. Then. Thank I'll, you. I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> Good lad. Um, bright start, but it, it, is, it, it is clouding over quite quickly now, and I think in some parts of Three Counties you'll probably class this as a rather disappointing cloudy day. Um, there, there, there's going to be some showers 
carry rain around as well, I'm afraid. So um, nothing especially heavy, but certainly enough to wet you, and that'll be an off-and-on affair as well. So together with the cloud and the rain, I, th- I think a disappointing day overall after a promising bright start as you head off for work if you're out for the early train this morning. Um, yeah, that, that's the sunny bit of the day done with. Maximum. Oh, but Jim, sorry to interrupt. You sounded all apologetic then. I felt sorry for you for a second. You don't well, have to apologise to us. Well, it's not it your a, fault. It is a shame, isn't it? Well, you get up with such great optimism and it, throw back the curtains. The sun's out there. You think, yeah, this is good. I'll yep. take this. And then what happens? By the time you've finished your cereals, you're, yeah, that's it. Jim. It's gone. But Jim, don't, uh, don't, don't, anyway, you don't need to apologise. Well, OK. You be I'll proud it, of what you've got to I'll give us. Take it on the chin. Good and lad. Be very pleased with the 18 Celsius you're going to struggle with. Is that what we've got for today? That is all you've got for today. Fantastic. 18 Celsius, 64 Fahrenheit, moderate southwesterly wind, so if you're cycling to work, you've got a tailwind if you're heading in the right direction, of course. As for tonight, I think the shower's dying away, clear spells, and then not too bad a night, dry with uh, well-broken cloud, but a chilly night, down to 9 Celsius. Uh, Friday and Saturday could both produce showers after a bright start. Friday's showers could be quite heavy, whereas Saturday's I don't think will be very heavy, and Sunday, and here's the good bit, do feel proud about this bit. Yes. Uh, that's looking mainly fine and dry, a bit of sunshine, a little bit warmer. Could be quite a nice day by the time we get to Sunday and possibly into Monday as well. Jim, I'll take that. Thank you very much, Jim Bacon, there with the weather. Now, you're listening to BBC Three Counties Radio and it's 7.23. A Bedfordshire rave group says it's great the police and council are working together when it comes to the music events. A rave was held in the Heath and Reach area back in May, which has prompted new measures to be put in place. Residents complained about the loud noise and the fact that it went on for eight hours after officers told the organisers to keep it down. Well, our reporter, Gareth Lloyd, is in the field with Glenn Jenkins from Leviticus. Hello, Gareth. Thanks very much, Ian. Yes, Glenn, uh, firstly, uh, this uh, rave that happened back in May wasn't with, with your group, but uh, uh, we, let's start at the beginning. W- what makes a rave? Why, why is a rave different to a, a concert? Well, for a start, it goes on all night long. You know, we, our, our, our events don't start till midnight, so that, that, there's a clear difference. They're all night wrongs, which is ancient. You know, the, the ancient right as we would see it to dance beneath the stars watch the sun come up this is sit around the fire these are things that go back thousands of years not 20 years as they do in in bedfordshire but i've you know you know me i've been doing this for 20 years and 20 years ago here ethan reach we've had some stomping parties here and it's just amazing that here we are 20 years later and still we've got councillors oh we need to do a little bit more in putting up in, in enforcement it just doesn't you know it's too, we're having discussions gareth at the moment with the Duke of Bedford Central Beds Council about formal sanction sites throughout Bedfordshire where, as Mark Vassalian says, the speakers are pointed in the right direction, etc. It just takes cooperation between the council, the police and the ravers, not just the council and the police. Will the ravers then be interested if, if an illegal rave became a legal one? Does that take the, the edge off of it? Well, our, our, we, we campaigned for eight years, we squatted sites for eight years, and eventually the common sense solution between ourselves, the Duke and the police, ended up, resulted in a number of parties on legal sites. They're the biggest and best we've ever had. It's not the illegality, it's the outsideness, it's the non commerciality, i.e., the affordability, because another major difference between our events and, and nightclubs is you ain't paying £12 to get in and about £6 a beer at the bar. And, and, you know, Bedfordshire and everywhere else has to recognise there's an excluded mass of people who just can't afford that. So in terms of affordability, non-commercial, outside, beneath the stars, round the fires and loud music all night. So what we need is sites... It'll be fine if it's legal. And I know all the, you know, most of the rave groups in Bedfordshire. I'm good friends and they're brothers and sisters of mine here. And I know that we're all looking for a constructive solution. But the younger guys here, yeah, they're, they're not, you know, they're going to keep doing it. It's going to keep happening all throughout Bedfordshire and the country until there's a common-sense solution. That's on the table in Bedfordshire. If the Duke of Bedford's willing to work with it, I'd invite Mark Vassalian to sit down with me discuss what we're the process we're going through and join in it mark uh you and i both were at the love luton festival you had a tent and i had a tent as well and we know the months of preparation and work and health and safety and background that has to go into making an event safe Mm. Uh, do you think raves have that amount of infrastructure behind them and the team big enough to keep the event safe well they do if they're if they're given you know three days rather than three minutes to set up and and you know we can do it in three minutes if need be you know there's there's lots of us throughout the county and we're committed and we're committed to our culture and all of that so of course we can do it we've proven we can do it exodus leviticus have proven we can do it what it needs is i mean look in affordability terms 
our proposal for a, a, a festival site at Frieda Spirit Festival site at Sunderland Pits would generate money which would pay for what we'd call an, an underground depot, if you like. So in that depot would be toilets, fencing, lighting, the sort of things you can't expect kids to have the resources, especially skink kids, to have the resources to pay for. So the infrastructure would be there, people could pick it up, go to a number of, one of a number of sanctioned sites, and then not only the infrastructure and the number of people, but it's safe, it's an accord, it's agreed between everybody, it makes sense. And after 20 years, Gareth, it really is about time. The one thing, though, that uh, when you do talk about raves, the, the, the average person does link it to a, a drugs culture. Mm. Uh, would that be a, a safely managed uh, a problem on, on these events? I mean, d- what do you do about it at, at illegal raves at the moment? Well, again, as I say to you, even at our illegal raves, well, I don't call them illegal, I call them unlicensed, yeah? But, but even at our unlicensed events, when we did them or if we had to do them again, it's the responsibility is still ours to provide support for that kind of thing. Now, if you go to any nightclub, in Luton or anywhere else in the country. Drugs are awash everywhere, they're a part of society. What with the raves now, what we do is we have a we have a tent manned by people from release. We had we worked with we done drug training, drugs awareness training course and trained all of our stewards in that. Which is another example of if you're gonna be commonsensical about it and provide the support and make sure that these things are catered for, that's the responsible thing to do. Not just for the kids who are going but for the county, for the people and for parents who might be concerned about that sort of thing. With the knock-on from May and the police now talking to the council about a a way forward, that can only be a good thing for for raving in in Bedfordshire and the rest of the country because it'll just follow suit, won't it? Well, I hope, what we're hoping in our work with the Duke and the council, I mean, we did an event last October to demonstrate to the council, to the Safety Action Group on Central Beds Council, how effective and safe it can be, you know, and it was a complete success. We were complete. We were praised by all members, you know, from the police to the fire to the ambulance to everybody else. We had access to the event. It just makes sense, yeah. So it really is time for, for a solution. And it would make sense and make a template. The Duke of Bedford feels, and we feel, that it could make a template for places all over the country that this county could set a better way of doing things that can be modelled. Glenn Jenkins, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Ian. Gareth, thank you very much indeed. Well, what do you think? I reckon Glenn should get together with Love Luton for next next year, and, and they can put the party on, huh? Wouldn't, wouldn't be any messing around then. Uh, selfish or responsible? Oh eight four five nine four double five five double five. Call 08459 four double five five double five. Oh eight four five nine four double five five double five. BBC Three Counties Radio. We're talking about the raves earlier on, and there's a story in, the, in a couple of the papers today. Uh, more Evica is the headline in um, the Mirror. Uh, outrage as reverend to take drugs on TV. And basically, Channel Four have apparently filmed a program where Keith Allen, um, Lionel Shriver, Shriver, the author, uh, an ex SAS soldier, a former MP, and a, a lady minister, uh, a, a film taking ecstasy to see what the, the effects are. <laughs> What do you reckon? Yeah, of course, the, the, you know, there should be some sort of monitoring of drugs. Of course there should be. Do it on TV? I don't know. Oh, I don't know. Oh, wait, four five nine four double five five double five. For the fourth month running, unemployment figures are falling. According to the Office for National Statistics, unemployment has dropped by 65,000 in the three months to the end of May. So is it getting any easier to find a job or are these figures deceptive? Because at the same time, the number of people claiming job seekers allowance has increased. Earlier on, we heard uh, how a new job club had been set up for 16 to 19-year-olds in the Marsh Farm area of Luton. The purpose of this job club is essentially help young people between the ages of 16 to 19-year-olds who are not in education, employment or training of any kind. And we are here with some professional uh, personal advisors, they're called PAs, who can actually give you a hands-on support and advice on finding the job for you. And if it's not a job that you're looking for, if you're looking for uh, some training programme, they will also help around that. Uh, any issue relating to learning, job and training that we'll be able to help you. But what employment opportunities are there for people over the age of 16 to 19? Mark Hampson from Bletchley has been out of work for nearly a year and at the age of 54 he's now going back to college to learn some new skills. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Ian. Do you feel at the age of 54 that it's harder to find work? Definitely. I, <coughs> you've, I, I've been listening this morning and uh, I wonder where... Uh, 
where they get the figures from, and I, it just doesn't ring true. Um, job seekers is up. Um, the only way, the only thing I can think of is it. Um, the job seekers are actually on these government schemes mm. that you still get your job seekers allowance while you're on there. Yeah, do you know what we spoke? I spoke to someone on the uh, the JVS show a couple of weeks ago, uh, and it is something like that. If you're on one of the schemes, you still get job seekers, I think, but you're uh, not classed as being unemployed, so you get taken off the unemployment list. I think that's how it works. I think that is, but um, there's a lot of them, really. They're like salesmen that um, if they get you a job within six months, they get a large quantity of money, mm. and it's it's quite a lot, actually. There's you, quite a lot of these schemes around. So do these new figures, with the, the unemployment figures um, dropping, does that give you any hope at all, or do you just see it as kind of a little bit of smoke and mirrors? Well, I, I definitely think it's smoke and mirrors. I, I go to the uh, job centres in various places. I go to one in London now, actually, mm. when I'm down that way because I've got to search out of there uh, in uh, an area where I can stay from Monday to Friday if I, if I need to, to get work. But I, I'm in a job centre normally three times a week and then a job club. And I still see the same people, but I think you've got to break it down. You've got um, your 18 to 24-year-olds. You you've even can break them down bec- um, between sort of 18 and 19 year olds um, that have never had a job, there's some that have left school and never had a job, there's some have gone back to college, so mm. you, you've, I, I suppose they must be putting those uh, people uh, uh, into the figures, but, but I'm not finding it any easier, but you know, I'm, everybody's got a different situation, yeah. Ian. It's, I've <laughs> got, I've got I've got some little small issues, sort of thing. Of, uh, I'm 54 years old. I don't tick the boxes for modern, um, modern uh, jobs, sort of thing. I've only had three jobs, um, and I've got to try to go to college to learn the basics. How many? Jo- you, you lost your job in August last year. Is that right? Yeah, I, I unfortunately, uh, they. I don't mind saying it. Go one on. in five adults uh, uh, have mental problems, yep. and uh, I had a midlife crisis, and uh, I lost my job after 23 years in the same job. Can I ask you, and if this is too personal a question, no. then don't a- don't answer it and tell me to mind my own business. How did your midlife crisis manifest itself? What happened to you? A build up to it. It's if you tell. I, I got made redundant about uh, three years ago, and I was only unemployed for about a month and a bit. I got retaken back on at the same company I worked for, but on a temporary contract doing the same job. But if you say to somebody six start and stop dates, you actually say goodbye. It's equivalent to going to the gallows and getting a, a 11th hour reprieve. I, at one point, I was even going out the gates, and they called me back in and said, go back into the office, you go back in, and, um, oh, we're going to extend you by about another two or three months. It starts to play up on your mind, right. um, especially after 23 years, of, in, in almost, well, a bit, it was 22 years in the same job. So six start and stops. So uh, they, well, they were, sorry, they were saying, right, your job's going to end in, t- in uh, next week. Oh, no, yeah. hang on a minute, you're going to have a couple more weeks. Or a three month, right. two months, one month. Yeah. It, it, it would vary, and that played up. That played up on my uh, my mind, especially when you've gone round. Because I, I know a lot of people at the yeah. company I was with, and you know, after a while, that will play up on your mind. Um, and you lost you confidence. And, say again. Ian. You, you, you lost confidence. I lost confidence. A, a college uh, uh, teacher yeah. that said. I think you've had a bit of a kick in, he yeah, described yeah. it. What are you studying at college? Would you believe basic English and maths? There we go, there's nothing wrong, there's no shame in that. Y- yeah, I'm, uh, I, I seem to have de- Good developed for you. dyslexic in my. I don't know what's, why it's, uh, you know, why I've uh, developed it because I even put whole words the wrong way around it, yeah. you know, but I've got. I don't tick those boxes yeah. that employees want. I go for a test. Uh, um, I've had about um, 14 or 15 tests and I just go to pieces yeah. I just, a lot of confidence I come across as pretty assertive but I know my limitations Mark, can I ask, have you seen a doctor about this? It's funny, it's funny the doctor um, yes, I, yes, I, I had to have uh, three months of 
going to psychiatrists yeah. uh, one day a week because it was a problem that yeah. uh, needed to be sorted out. Makes me sound bad, but... No, 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 no it doesn't make you sound bad. Um, Listen, we've all been there. I'm we've pretty all... honest. Listen, I'm the honest man of radio, the, and, as they say. And well done for being honest. There's nothing bad about that at all. You know, everyone's... Everyone, uh, you know, it's, it's like something like two and four or three or four. I think everyone goes through some sort of, sort of mental trauma at some point in their life, whether it's depression, it's a break, whatever. Everyone goes through it. So there's no shame in it at all. And well done you for going on and realising you've got a problem with, with your maths and your reading and going to crack on with it. Listen, uh, Mark, keep us in touch. Keep in touch with us and let us know how it goes on, OK? Will do, Ian. Good, good lad. Well, I wish you the very best of luck there. No shame in that in the slightest. Well done. Um, we've got Steve. is in Dunstable. Good morning, Steve. Hello, morning. morning. What have you called in about? Um, the drugs. Yes. We're talking, we're talking about drugs at raves and there's this TV programme where they're going to be taking ecstasy on, and be filmed taking it. Well, we, we should manage... We should, well, legalise it and tax it with cream of fortune out of it. That's one. Another thing is we need to manage it better. We, you're allowed to drink alcohol and that's managed and if you become an alcoholic you go to the AA or whatever. So why can we not do it with drugs? And also you'll take out the criminal element of making millions of pounds and abusing other people to, in, in the, in the criminal, uh, criminal world. Surely it makes sense in the 21st century. Well, it does. It, it makes some sense in that, yes, there would be huge amounts of money to be made from it. But just it, because, because you make something that's illegal, you make it legal and therefore you stop that crime. That's not necessarily a strong enough argument, is it? Because murder is illegal. And if we made murder legal, then murderers wouldn't be in prison. You know, you'd cut down on them. Crime. It's not a particularly strong arguments. Drugs, drugs are dangerous, aren't they? Yeah, but what, what's alcohol? If you could reclassify yeah. alcohol, that'd be a class A. Yeah. It's all right for everyone to go down the pub, like we all do, and drink no. that, but more people die from alcohol than, than the other drugs. And at the end of the day, alcohol is worse. Like I say, alcohol is one of the worst drugs. But yeah, because it's, we've been at it for 2,000, 3,000 years, that's OK. But, you know, if, you, if someone has a couple of spliffs a week, what's wrong with that? That's up to them. At the end of the day, they're not harming anybody, are they? But the thing is, they're funding crime, which which leads a long, long list of the criminal world. But at the end of the day, you, you've got to start just managing it, because you, you, it's ridiculous. Steve, can I ask, do you have a couple of spliffs a week? No, I don't, I don't touch it. Okay. <laughs> I, need, I need to drink a few beers. Well, then that's interesting that you think that, that you're, you kind of want to legalise drugs. And are you saying legalise all drugs? Well, yeah. Well, even heroin and cocaine. If, if, it's, if, it's, if it's managed properly and people can live with it and not persecuted for doing it... But people can't manage heroin. Well, people can't. Well, people no, they can't. Have you ever seen a heroin addict? Have you ever spoken no, no, to a heroin I, I, addict? Listen, I must admit, I, 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 I haven't. So I have. On that subject, I, I can't really sort of... I have. It's a train. mess. They can't control it. There's very few heroin users who can control it. It's a horrible <laughs> drug. It's the same yeah, but alcohol's worse than all them other drugs. I don't know, listen, <laughs> I, I, I agree with you in some respect. Alcohol is a, is, a, is a very bad drug. I don't drink. But uh, is it worse than heroin? I don't know. And I've got, I've got friends who have been heroin addicts, right? It's a dirty drug, you know. It really is a dirty, dirty drug. And there are some people that can use drugs and, and use them, you know, once every few months, and that's fine, and it's, it's like having a beer or something like that. But I don't, I don't know anybody who, who can use heroin casually and be in control of it. It's a dirty, dirty thing. Steve, I've got to move on. Thank you very much for that. Uh, 08459 four double five five double five. Beds, hearts and bugs news. BBC Three Counties Radio. 746, these are your headlines on BBC Three Counties Radio on Thursday, July the 19th. Police and council officials say they are working together to prevent illegal raves after a rave in a field near Heath and Reach in Bedfordshire, close to the A5 Flying Fox roundabout in May. Residents say police were there initially but then left, leaving the rave to carry on from four in the morning until midday. A Hertfordshire woman has backed her son's decision to refuse a fresh medical test to see if he's fit to be extradited to the USA. Gary McKinnon, who has Asperger's syndrome, is accused of hacking into Pentagon and NASA computers, but he insists he was looking for evidence of UFOs. In sport, the Open Golf Championship is underway at Royal Lytham, with Buckinghamshire's world number one Luke Donald again aiming to win his first major. The weather for beds, hearts and bucks, bright spells at first, but otherwise rather cloudy, with the chance of some showery rain developing, maximum temperature 18 degrees celsius coming up a hertfordshire charity which helps more than 300 people with hiv and aids says the county council are ignoring concerns and being misleading about plans for the future good morning dear listen this is ian lee uh, on bbc three counties radio the united states says the killing of senior syrian officials in a bomb attack shows that president bashar al-assad is losing control of his country the white house said barack obama had discussed the growing violence in syria in a telephone call with president putin of russia syrian 
rebels have said they were behind the bombing on Wednesday that killed Mr Assad's brother-in-law and defence minister. The blast follows several days of fighting in the capital, Damascus. Let's talk to Nabila Ramdani, a journalist and expert in Middle Eastern politics. Good morning, Nabila. Good morning. Uh, is the, likely the fighting is now going to get worse? Yes, indeed. Uh, I, I think uh, the uh, Syrian regime suffered a, a major blow yesterday and uh, the most serious one uh, by far, um, uh, 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 so far. And I would contend that it's not a crippling one and certainly not a death blow uh, to the Syrian regime. And we've heard the immediate uh, reaction from the communication minister broadcast on state television who played an all-out war against what he called uh, terrorists. And it's an indication that the Syrian regime is withdrawing further into uh, survival mode. And sadly, this also means that there will be more bloodshed and indeed more massacres to come as the crackdown will get even more ruthless uh, and the battle has a long way to run, I would contend. What do you think is going to happen next? Well, uh, it's, uh, the uh, Syrian regime has already uh, started, uh, embarked on a retaliation because the uh, violence overnight has been absolutely ruthless. And let's not forget that Assad has at his disposal uh, weapons that he hasn't used uh, so far, including fighter jets and indeed, uh, more dauntingly, uh, chemical weapons. Now, the international community has been very much... Um, um, uh, concerned by the latest development, saying uh, that you know it weakened uh, the um, Syrian regime to a certain extent, and the very fact that the U.S. President um, Barack Obama has spoken directly to the Russian President Vladimir Putin is an indication that everything is being done um, on the diplomatic level to try and get Russia to be more flexible and more open to discussion and perhaps stop backing uh, so determinedly uh, the Assad regime. Is there anything we can do uh, as an international community to intervene? Well, it, it's a very difficult uh, thing to uh, do indeed because the uh, international community is very much uh, at the hands, uh, in the hands of Russia, if I may put it that way. Russia's immediate reaction yesterday was to announce that it's the final battle, it's a decisive war, um, and uh, pledged uh, its unconditional support uh, to uh, Bashar al-Assad and, and his regime. I think for Russia, it's more than uh, announcing uh, a support support for Assad. It's about Russia's place in global politics and the fact that after having lost uh, crucial allies in the region, including Saddam Hussein in, in Iraq and more recently Gaddafi in Libya, it doesn't want to lose yet another uh, crucial ally in the region in the, in the form of uh, Assad. So uh, the international community's uh, action are very much... Uh, uh, restrained by the position of Russia. Nabila, thank you very much. Nabila Ramdani, who is a journalist and expert in Middle Eastern politics. Now, a Hertfordshire charity, which helps more than 300 people, says the, con- uh, the county, co- county council is being misleading about its future. Last week, we reported that the Crescent, a service for people in St Albans with HIV and AIDS, is under threat due to a lack of funding. Now, the charity says the council is ignoring its concerns. Ian Merton, manager of the Crescent, is here to tell us more. Good morning, Ian. Good morning. Ian. Uh, what's the problem? Um, um, well, the problem sort of started um, last year when the county council decided to award a, a county-wide contract to HeartsAid, the other provider, and effectively shift our funding to them. So it's not a case of the county council needing to save money. They're actually using the money for some other to, to give to another, another charity. Now, the issue we have, and we've had from right from the start, is that it now seems that all of the emphasis is still on the east. Mm. HeartsAid covered the east, we covered the west because of the transport difficulties across county for the last 20 odd years and we we suggested that there was going to be a problem that Hartsaid would concentrate more on the east than they would on the west and that is exactly what's happening so the people that we've got and we're looking after in the west at the moment have nowhere realistic to go so if we close they'll be left with no alternative i mean if you look at the east provision for Hartsaid. They've got seven locations that they advertise in their events calendar for the east of the county Mm. and only one in the west. And the majority of people living with HIV in Hertfordshire live in the west. Right. So... Do you think you're going to have to accept that your service will close? I hope that we don't have to get to that point. Right. I really do. I mean, some of these people I've known for 20-plus years, and they're not only are they service members, but they are friends, effectively. I know so much about them. We... 
uh, as their support agency are probably the, some in most instances the only people that know about their status mm. so if we go they've lost that connection which is why we are still doing it part paid and part as vol- as volunteers because the money is reducing um, in order to keep the service available for the people that need it. It's not just about your services, because many charities around the country are facing funding cuts. Do you need to change the way you operate and try and find money elsewhere? Um, well, that's what we're doing as well. It's yeah. not a case simply of just saying, well, we need the county council's money. Um, we are actively seeking funds from all over the place. But the problem, as you've just indicated, is there are so many agencies all, sh- all, all chasing such a small pool of money mm. that's now available, trusts, etc., all oversubscribed. Getting hold of additional funding is difficult. And let's not forget, this isn't a funding issue. The money from central government for HIV and AIDS support is actually increasing year on year. Mm. Hertfordshire County Council this financial year had 508,000 for this purpose. The NHS, who also contribute to this arrangement, are still maintaining their funding. Mm. So there's not a funding issue. The money that we were getting and we were, we were promised for last year has been given to HeartsAid. You were promised that money? Yeah, well, that was the, the idea originally was that we would make a 25% saving. Mm. This was announced to us in November 2010, um, which we were prepared to do. Mm. And then come January of 2011, we just were told that our contracts wouldn't be renewed and the money was being given to Hearts Aid. Um, and they say there was a tender, but if there's only one person invited to tender or put in a, a, a quote, then that's not a competi- competitive uh, environment. Well, Hertfordshire County Council aren't here, but they have sent us a statement, which I should, I should read in full um, to put their point across, and then you can come back to this. Uh, it's important to emph- emphasise that there is county com- uh, council-funded support available across Hertfordshire for anyone living with HIV provided through Hearts Aid, a local charity with more than 20 years' experience. The Crescent's complaints about our decision to award a county-wide contract to Hearts Aid have been independently investigated by the local government ombudsman. The ombudsman dismissed the complaints and confirmed that the council followed due process in awarding the contract. We recognise that many people receiving support from the Crescent would prefer to continue to do so, but we cannot afford to fund multiple organisations to provide the same service, as this would mean decreasing the amount we spend in other vital areas, such as support for people with learning difficulties, people with dementia and recovery services for people with mental health problems, all equally as vulnerable as people living with HIV. That's a statement from Hearts County Council. What do you make of that? Um, well, it's, it's exactly the, sa- the response I would have expected from the County Council. Mm. As I've just said, the amount of money they get that's specifically identified within their grant for this purpose is actually increasing. And the National AIDS Trust actually campaigned strongly to, for that to, to be so. Mm. Um, and they also published a report last year, uh, earlier this year, rather, um, containing uh, information that they felt was worrying where local authorities would start to siphon the money off to use elsewhere to pay for other other cuts Mm. Um, and as we said we were quite prepared to take a cut in funding we weren't saying that um, we wanted exactly the same amount of money year on year or even an increase given that the money was increasing just the funding that they'd said they were going to award us Mm. which they can easily do and still have money left over what do you do now what's the next step uh, the next step is to continue with our, our campaign. We, we launched a, a fundraising appeal at the House of Lords at the end of April, um, and we've got multiple applications in with different trusts for money. But again, as I said, there's a lot of people chasing a small amount of, of funding. How much money have you got? How long, you know, in terms of time, how long have you got with the money you've got in, as, in reserve? As paid uh, individuals probably until the end of August, wow. beginning of September. But as volunteers, because... Again, from a, from a cost-saving point of view, um, if we look at the last financial year, for example, Hearts Aid cost the county council in, in um, staff pay and leases and, and property rental £240,000. Mm. That was the expenditure in their accounts for those purposes. The Crescent was 139. Mm. Yet the county council maintained that Hertfordshire, uh, Hearts Aid are the better party for cost-effectiveness. Mm don't agree at all and the, f- the figures actually show themselves ian let us know how it goes on uh, we'll, we'll hear more of this as it goes on this is ian murta the manager uh, of the crescent um which is losing its funding um if you've got any views on that 08459 455 555 we've got a text from jill good morning how come these kids that can't afford concerts can afford drugs 
because drugs are cheap and concerts are not. This is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties Radio. Uh, phones, mo- uh, pay phones. When did you last use a pay phone to make a phone call? Speak to you after this. The latest news and sport now with Simon Oxley. This is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties Radio. The case of computer hacker Gary McKinnon, who's accused of accessing NASA and Pentagon computers, is back in the spotlight this morning. The 46-year-old who has Asperger's syndrome was given until today to decide whether to have a fresh medical test needed to see if he's fit to be extradited. He's refused to have it, but his mum from Hertfordshire says he didn't have a real choice. Janice Sharp, who lives near Hatfield, said it was going to be conducted by someone who wouldn't be able to diagnose his suicide risk, and four previous assessments have shown he's unfit for trial. Janice is here, and we'll speak to Janice in just a second, but First of all, we've got Conservative uh, uh, MP David Burrows, is Gary's local MP. Good morning, David. Good morning. You've been involved in uh, a number of campaigns supporting Gary. Why? Why? Well, it's, um, he's my, my constituent, but more so he, he represents uh, a huge issue of uh, human rights where we need to take the right decision for uh, human rights' sake. Just It just makes basic sense that uh, someone like Gary, a vulnerable young man who is facing extradition and um, all the medical evidence says that uh, he's likely to um, commit suicide if he is extradited. And this is a a young man that um, should be nowhere um, facing sort of a deadline, facing effectively a a gun against his head. That shouldn't happen and he should be someone who should be able to face any prosecution and justice in this country and not face the prospect and the real prospect that he could lose his life of being extradited to the US. So you, you admit that he's, he's, he's broken the law and has to be punished. Yeah, you, you're no, fine with no that. One's, no one's wanting to, and he's certainly here not to flee away from any justice. No, mm. of course not. Uh, but you, you're convinced that he, it, the justice should happen in this country and um, it shouldn't be happening in the US. Well, that's right. And, you know, there's, there's an imbalance because, you know, no US citizen has been extradited when an offence has been committed on US soil. But Gary is facing it for, what is it? For someone who hacked into, um, hacked into US systems, but basically exposed, exposed the flaws. And this is 10 years ago. This, we're talking about a deadline today, but he's had this hanging over him, hanging over for all these years. And, you know, no way should he be facing the situation he's facing today. We've had the medical evidence. We've had the assessments that he's unfit to face trial that, um, he is um, sadly suicidal. So let's do the decent and right thing and just stop this extradition here and now. No, I have to say, because I have to kind of be uh, as fair as I can on this, you, yeah. you, you sort of downplayed his crime slightly there. He did hack in to NASA in the Pentagon, and yes, he was, you know, he was looking for UFOs or whatever, but, it, it, you know, that is still a, a, a bad thing to have done, a potentially dangerous thing to have done. It is, and, you know, we want to extradite um, terrorists, don't we? That's what the legislation should be in place for, for people who are threatening um, our safety or the safety of other countries. But, frankly, I mean, you know, Gary is not um, threatening anyone's safety, is he? And he's someone who, yes, let him be prosecuted, let him be prosecuted for misusing computers, and you know, if that had happened many years ago, he could have faced a sentence in this country and be dealt with. No mm. one's saying don't have that, but let's not, you know, not, let's not snap a huge sledgehammer, a huge sledgehammer, to crack what is um, a nut, and it's, it's just it's just not not on. And um, we need to now do the decent thing and just put Gary and indeed Janice, who you hear from shortly, out of the misery of ten years, and let's just stop this extradition here and now. Okay, David, just stay on the line. And Janice is here, and if you want to chip in at any point, uh, you can. We have got Gary's mum, Janice from Hertfordshire, in the studio now. Uh, Janice, why isn't Gary going to have this medical examination? Uh, I'll tell you. Can I just tell you first? There's a boy called Ryan Cleary. He admitted hacking into the Pentagon and to. NASA and to the uh, Air Force well, in America. But he's, no, he's Janice, been tried in this country. Janice, because I don't know about that story. I don't want to go into oh, that. he's been tried in this country. Okay, but I don't know yeah. about that story, so I don't want to do that. But why is he not going to have this medical examination? He's had uh, three medical examinations in April uh, by Professor Simon Baron Cohen, by Professor Turk, and by Dr. Vermeulen, who's a Home Office approved expert in assessing risk. And Gary has been diagnosed as. Uh, extreme suicide and unfit for trial, how many more can he have? But the problem is, the one that they want him to have Mm. is with a doctor who doesn't have any expertise in Asperger's or autism and cannot diagnose suicide risk in someone with it. And at the court on the 5th of this month, the judges said, of course it should have been an expert in the condition that was appointed, and why wasn't it? So if even the judges agree with us that Gary, uh, there should have been an expert appointed, not at Asking him to be assessed by someone who has no expertise in the condition. Why was it someone who wasn't an expert then appointed? Exactly. Two years ago, he was 
appointed and we objected at the beginning. The National Artistic Society wrote to the uh, Home Office. They wrote again to the Home Secretary. They said only someone with the expertise can diagnose someone with Asperger's for suicide risk because people with Asperger's don't have any facial expressions. Their voice is monotone. Uh, they don't have uh, uh, any sort of fear in their voice. And as Gary has often said, inside the fires of hell are burning. But if you don't understand the condition, you cannot see it in someone with Asperger's. And that is the problem. Him refusing to have this medical examination, what is, is that going to delay the decision on extradition? What effect is that going to have? No, it's not a ref- refusal. It's, it's an impossibility. Gary has agreed has never refused to be assessed by an expert in the field, never, so it's impossible. And we've said now it's been far too long that we want to rely on the evidence as it stands. He said countless medical assessments. So basically, Theresa May has to take the evidence as it stands. It's from Simon Baron Cohen, professor, who's the top in the world in his field. Mm. It's from Professor Turk, who's also, you know, beyond reproach. And Dr Vermullen worked in Broadmoor. He's a Home Office approved expert in assessing risk. And he's done hundreds of reports mm. and an expert witness for the Home Office. So he cannot, that, that has to be uh, accepted. It cannot be dismissed at all. It's in Theresa, Theresa May's hands. Yes. Uh, when do you think that a decision is going to be made? Well, I hope it's this week. I really do. I mean, both uh, the Conservatives and the Lib Dems uh, use Gary's uh, case as, as a key part of their campaign. Now, don't tell me that they would use a vulnerable man uh, in order for electioneering and, and then uh, try and sort of send him away, you know, all this time after. No, I don't believe they would do that. I believe Theresa May will refuse to extradite Gary. It's the only compassionate thing to do. And as David says, Gary's never tried to avoid extradition. I mean, not of course he has. He's never tried to avoid prosecution, sorry. Mm. And all we have ever asked is for Gary to be prosecuted in his own country, as every other hacker has and is being Mm. at this moment in time. Uh, David uh, Burrows, Gary's local MP. David, what do you think, um, Theresa May, have you got any clues what her decision might be? Well, I mean, um, you know, soon after the election, one of the first decisions she made as Home Secretary was to move it out of the court process and to say, I'm going to review medical evidence. And that gave us all great hope and expectation that for the first time we'd had a Home Secretary who's now going to not just rely on the court process, the legal game which we're going to and from, to actually look at medical evidence. If she looks at the medical evidence and all the medical evidence, then the only answer would be to stop extradition because it breaches his human rights because he's likely to commit suicide. It is that straightforward and that important. And so I am still very hopeful that if she looks at all the medical evidence, then she will make the right decision. Uh, David, maybe you can answer this. If he went to the States, he'd be facing 60 years in prison. What sentence would he be facing in this country? Well, if um, he'd been prosecuted for misuse of computers, added, then he could have been up to two years' imprisonment, and he could have served that a long time ago and be done and dusted. And so that's the kind of proportion we're looking at, the type of offence it is. It is a serious offence in terms of hacking. Computers, no one wants that to happen, but you know, let, let's give it a sense of proportion. And also now they'd have to take account of the fact of the time that Gary served under this, you know, effectively, and it, it was used, the words were used by, by Damon Greenwood in opposition of a death sentence and that's something which we now just need to remove from him because sadly it could be a reality if he was to be extradited to the US. Janice, Gary's mum, are you hopeful of, 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 a good, of a decision in your favour? Well I am, especially as the American defence expert who actually advises President Obama and advised Donald Rumsfeld has come out last week, which is amazing and said Gary McKinnon should not be prosecuted. He, he doesn't even want Gary prosecuted and his uh, colleague also a senior person in the military in America, has said Gary should not be jailed. So for these people in such incredibly senior positions to say this now, I think bodes well for Gary, and I'm fully expecting that Theresa May to say Gary will remain here in the UK. Cameron spoke to Obama about it, didn't he? Twice, actually. Um, do we know what, what Obama said? Yeah, well, he went to uh, Obama during the first joint worldwide press conference in America, and he did the same again a year later in Britain, perhaps it was the other way around, and uh, President 
President Obama said that it's a British decision that America will respect and accept. No one seems interested uh, anymore in wanting Gary extradited, not the Americans, right. not the politicians here, but the same advisers who have been advising the last government and were here even during uh, General Pinochet's extradition are the only ones that seem to want it because they think not extraditing Gary will set a precedent. Right. Well, that's not justice. That can't be what it's based on. It has to be based on uh, the actual facts. And Gary's case could not set a precedent because we have mental illness in the family going back three generations. My grandmother was in a, a mental institution for 50 years and she died there. Mm. Gary's paternal grandmother has schizophrenia. Okay, it sounds awful that, you know, this is in the family but the point is, all of that has to be taken mm. account of. No one else can invent this. It cannot set a precedent. Uh, David, if, if um, that's what Obama said, it's up to the UK, then yeah. surely that's a, 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 him basically saying, you know, don't send him over, isn't it? It is. Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's basically giving a green light for us to make the decision ourselves and not just to rely upon sort of the wider sort of relationships with America and, and the rest of it. And, and so it does give a free hand to just look and focus purely on Gary, on his medical evidence and seeing the fact that it would just be unfair and wrong to extradite him. So, yes, I mean, obviously the Home Secretary has to weigh, in, a weigh all account of all the factors and has to, you know, I mean, Janice mentioned the issue of precedent and no doubt there's advisors saying, hey, don't put any give any precedent that could you know be used by people who are terrorists and the rest of it but mm. you know we've got to the point now where the expectation is a legitimate expectation is on for gary is that he shouldn't be extradited the longer this has gone on frankly the more the case is in his favor that david we're going to end it there we're out of time thank you very much that's david burrows who's a conservative mp he's gary's uh, local mp uh, and uh, janice who is he's gary's mum it's it, you know i feel cold me saying it. it's fascinating um, and let us know when you get a decision and um, maybe come back in and, and let us know how things go. Right, and Grant Schatz has also been extremely good, I have to say. Well done, Janice. Thank you very much. Time for this. Let's get your headlines this morning on BBC Three Counties Radio. A Hertfordshire woman has backed her son's decision to refuse a fresh medical test to see if he's fit to be extradited to the USA. Gary McKinnon, who, who uh, has Asperger's syndrome, is accused of hacking into Pentagon and NASA computers, but he insists he was looking for evidence of UFOs. The government needs to do more to prevent ill health caused by alcohol misuse in England, according to a group of MPs. The cross-party health select committee suggested tougher regulation of the drinks industry, including a ban on sports advertising. In sport, Stevenage lost 2-0 at home to Tottenham in last night's friendly in front of over 5,000 fans at the Lamex Stadium. There's a full sports bulletin in 15 minutes. There'll also be a full weather bulletin in a moment. And coming up, a private healthcare company has been fined £100,000 after an 85-year-old patient died at a private hospital in High Wycombe. Find out more shortly. I'm joined now by Jonathan Vernon-Smith. Jonathan, we were discussing your show earlier on. Uh, I heard you. You're very nice. Gloria and Laura Branigan. Lo- Gloria. <laughs> no, don't, don't discuss Gloria and, uh, and yes. It's and a good song. It's a good song. It is a lovely, yeah. Well, I was listening to it on the M25 the other day, and I thought, oh, I remember this, and someone phoned in and said it's their favourite. We're, we're looking for the top five pop songs of all times. Oh. What's, your to- what's one of your oh, top pop gosh, songs? Oh, gosh, now you see, I should have... Uh, r- right, well, I'll tell you what my... Uh, would the- yes, this is pop. <laughs> Odyssey, native New Yorker. <laughs> Oh, yes. Why are you laughing at because that? Because it's a good song. It's I a love- brilliant song. It's one of my favourite songs. It's- Shall I tell you one of my others? Well, go on, Although, why not? Is this, a, is this a pop song? The Mavericks Dance the Night Away. Why do you <laughs> laugh at everything I say? I would say? You think I'm ridiculous, don't you? I'm never coming to any parties you have. <laughs> not that you'd ever invite me, but if that's, if that's the soundtrack... I would. I'd like you to come to a party. I'm not going to. Oh. I don't like people. Oh. No, I don't. I don't like people. No. I do. I'm very sociable. I have lots of dinner parties. Really? Soirees. Yes. This is... I, I just... I find people very... Un- it just make me uncomfortable. Why would I want to talk to people and hang out with them? Oh. I mean, this, this is nice because it's a controlled environment. It's three minutes long uh, and there's no awkward... So, what are you doing late? None of that. It's, the chat is almost planned. There's no awkwardness at my dinner parties. Everyone's sloshed. <laughs> <laughs> Why have you got your show this coming morning? up <laughs> coming up on the big phone in this morning at nine. Do security arrangements for the Olympics worry you?
No. Uh, there's more criticism today of the security firm G4S from politicians. A report from the report's Public Accounts Committee warns that the government needs to get a grip on the G4S uh, security company to ensure the Olympic Games run smoothly. And the Labour leader, Ed Miliband, says the company should be barred from taking on any more government contracts to provide police support services, which include some being considered in Bedfordshire until there's been a review into its competence. Well, from nine this morning, I want to hear your views on this. Do security arrangements for the Olympics worry you? I noticed Ian, you leapt straight in there and said, no, you're not worried at all. Well, no, because the army are doing it now, so they'll they'll be perfectly safe. But is there not a risk that, having brought in the army, it kind of publicises the fact to would-be terrorists Ooh. that we've not been able to sort things out. I and, thought of that. And does it also not make us even more of a target? Ooh. I mean, if we've got all of our troops yeah. all around the Olympic Stadium, does that make us even more of a target than we would have been? I hadn't thought of that, and I changed my answer from no to yes. I am worried now. You've scared the life out of me. I'm not going to go to any events, thanks to you, Jonathan. Thank you very much. Well, from nine this morning, I'd love to hear everyone else's view on this. Do security arrangements for the Olympics worry you? Here's the number. It's 08459 four double five five double five. You made me laugh out loud. Was it yesterday you were talking about exercise? Mm-hmm. And you had lots of um, uh, people of a certain age phoning in, and you said, you sounded really desperate. Is there anybody under 70 listening to this show <laughs> that, you've, that can call in? But it's just that. It's all perfect. You were getting lots of, lots of elderly people who are I very fit. lots of, uh, lots of elderly fit. people talking about exercise yesterday. Yeah, it was good. It was a good show. No, th- it. Thanks, did you? I, do, no, I, I love listening to your show, genuinely. I, I make sure I get out in time to listen to it and sit in my car. Well, I'm, I'm delighted. So you don't want to come to a dinner party, then? No, thanks, Jonathan. Oh, yeah. Jonathan Werner-Smith is, uh, <laughs> is on at nine o'clock. <laughs> That's him cackling his way out of my studio. Uh, <laughs> oh dear, always worth a listen It's, it's a cracking show at nine o'clock And it's, it, you know, it's, it's, it's just superb My favourite bit is the Consumer Hour Because having worked on it I, just, I know just, you know, he does He goes and makes those phone calls He phones at those companies And sometimes in the office You get to hear people be very, very rude to him there's one story that I can't allude to, but the, they were very, very rude to our poor JVS. We've got to move on, because it, it, always at this point of the show, things get very, very busy. Uh, a few more texts on your best pop song. Uh, Rabbit, Rabbit, Rabbit by Chaz and Dave sums you up. Says Dave in Bedford, you cheeky little sausage. Uh, and someone called April says Bohemian Rhapsody, please. OK, April, although I suspect you are Tuesday Wild Child just texting in under another name, I will add it to the list. This is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties Radio. It's 8.23. A private healthcare company has been fined £100,000 after an 85-year-old patient died at a private hospital in High Wycombe. The Health and Safety Executive, HSE, pro- uh, prosecuted BMI Healthcare Limited for safety failings that led to the death of Michael Walsh from Beaconsfield in Buckinghamshire. HSE Inspector Robert Meerden is on the line. Good morning, Robert. Good morning, Ian. Terribly tragic case, Robert. What What happened? Michael, 85-year-old, uh, was living at home in 2009, and he chose to go into hospital to have, a, have a, a relatively minor operation, and he chose the Shelburne Hospital in High Wycombe, which is a private hospital belonging to BMI Healthcare Limited. He was given a private room on the first floor. Half the rooms uh, on this floor had windows, a window sill and a tilting window, but the other half had a pair of sliding patio doors, which led onto a, a small balcony. And he had one of these rooms. Michael had the operation and that was successful. He began to recuperate. But three days after the operation, he started to suffer periods of confusion and delusion, which can happen to people after, after operation. Mm, of course. Um, these periods were managed initially, uh, helped by members of the family who came and helped settle him. Unfortunately, the following day, the third day after, um, he had a particularly bad spell in the evening and for various reasons he was then left alone in his room for a short period of time he somehow well not somehow he he managed to open the uh, sliding patio doors got onto the balcony and we don't know why but he managed to either climb over or fall from the balcony from the first floor balcony and land on the floor outside beneath and this was february it was going to be very cold he was found a little while later we're not quite sure how long he was out there he was sitting on the floor um they took him off to Wexham Park Hospital, actually, to the A&E there, and he was found to have a, a cracked vertebrae, mm. uh, broken ribs, so breathing was going to be very difficult. Uh, over the next couple of days, his condition deteriorated, and unfortunately then he died. 
What, what a sad story. This it is, is a very sad story. And terribly it's very sad. unnecessary. What can be learnt from this? The healthcare sector, which includes places like hospitals, nursing homes, residential homes, there is a history um, of people falling or, or jumping out of windows, particularly. Balconies like this are fairly mm. rare. Uh, which is why guidance has been around, and you'll find that if you go to places like hospitals and care homes, you'll find that uh, all of the windows have got restrictors mm. on, so you can only open them three or four inches wide. At the Shelbourne, the rooms that have got windows did have the restrictors. Unfortunately here, what BMI had failed to do was to recognise that the sliding patio doors, for which there were no keys, there was no way of locking them at all, mm. gave a very readily access uh, to people to go onto the balcony and fall off and places like hospitals and these homes have vulnerable people, mm. people like children, people in uh, confused mental states of various sorts, uh, and even people who uh, may want to do self-harm. So it's very important that in all these places, windows and places like these balcony doors uh, are secured um, to make sure that people cannot jump off or fall off. Robert, uh, what, what a terribly tragic story. Robert Midden, thank you very much. He's a, an HSE in, inspector, and it should be said that in a statement, BMI Healthcare said they pleaded guilty at an early stage and took immediate action to address the issues raised to make sure the incident could never be repeated. That's um, Michael Walsh, who, uh, who died. Isn't that terribly, terribly sad? It was almost I- inappropriate to move on to something lighter, but such is the nature of these kind of programmes, that's what we do. Coming up later on in the show, the last half an hour of the show, we will be asking, when was the last time you used a phone box? They're still out there. I, and it, it amazes me that in this day and age, they're still around. I'm trying to think. I can't think when the last time I used a phone box was. It would have been... I mean, it would have been years ago. Partly because, in the old days, before mobile phones, I knew all the numbers I needed in my head. Had them all. Had my mum's, had my sister's, had my, girl, had my girlfriend's, everything. All the numbers I needed in my head. Now, I, have, I don't know any numbers. I don't even know my mum's number. How bad is that? She moved about three years ago. I've never learnt the number. So, if I don't have my mobile phone with me, I can't phone mum. It's under mum home. So, that's one reason. Also, let's be honest, the phone boxes, they just stink, don't they? You know what people have been doing in there? When I say use the phone box, I mean to make a phone call, not to have a wee-wee or something. Because they're just horrible, dirty things. Just disgusting. 08459 455 555. When was the last time you used a phone box? Um, We've got a couple of texts here. A couple of texts on Gary McKinnon. We had his mum in, Janice. Given the somewhat hysterical reaction of America to Gary and his search for alien life... Could the real reason they want him be that he was getting too close to their secrets? Says Anne in St Albans. Uh, Christian in the A1 says, Crazy, how long must this go on with a family suffering? Uh, leave Mr McKinnon alone and put this to bed. Good luck, Gary. Uh, talking about unemployment. Ian, the unemployment statistics in this country are a farce. The government juggle them to make them look better. Even people who are made to work at companies by the job centre for no pay on a trial basis are classed as employed. What a joke. That's from Gary and Luton. Getting beds, hearts and bugs talking. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. These are your headlines this morning on BBC Three Counties Radio at 830 A Hertfordshire woman has backed her son's decision to refuse a fresh medical test to see if he's fit to be extradited to the USA. Gary McKinnon, who has Asperger's syndrome, is accused of hacking into Pentagon and NASA computers, but he insists he was looking for evidence of UFOs. The government needs to do more to prevent ill health caused by alcohol misuse in England, according to a group of MPs. The Cross-Party Health Select Committee suggested tougher regulation of the drinks industry, including a ban on sports advertising. In sport, Stevenage lost 2-0 at home to Tottenham in last night's friendly in front of over 5,000 fans at the Lamex Stadium. We'll have a full full sports bulletin soon. In fact, I think we can now go to our uh, official newsreader. Let's go to Simon Oxley. Simon. Yes, thank you. And apologies for that. Uh, computer problems. Uh... Call 08459 455 555. 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you, Simon. We got there in the end. I like it when computers go wrong and, uh, and things stop. It makes everything a little bit more exciting, doesn't it? We had a, a problem with the computer a couple of days ago. It makes, keeps, it makes you feel alive. 
very few times you feel alive. We all get a bit lazy and a bit, a bit complacent. But things like that, keep you on your toes, keep you alive. This is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties Breakfast. You've still got a few minutes if you want to text in uh, your suggestions for the best uh, pop song of all time. And uh, we've, I, I, I think we've got the top five in place, but you've got a couple of minutes if you want to change that. 813-333-CR. Uh, you should start your text with. We're talking about uh, drugs. We were talking about raves and then the, kind of mentioned the TV show that's going to be, be on Channel 4, hosted by Jon Snow, apparently, who I'm a huge fan of. Uh, where several people are apparently, according to the papers, filmed taking ecstasy, including Keith Allen, uh, a former MP, and a lady vicar. So um, we shall see about that a little bit later on. But we've got a caller, we've got Judith in Biggleswade. Good morning, Judith. Good morning. Good morning, Judith. What's your, what's your take on this? Uh, well, yeah, my opinion is that people are best to go out and have a, two or three drinks than rather turn around and have drugs and because you can't even go to the loo that's not being horrible, I know that you can't go to the loo unless you've got well, they might be your friends don't mean to say they're not on drugs and they turn around and just nip one in your glass So Hang on a minute, why, sorry, why can't you go to the loo? Well, because you don't leave your drink on the side, do you? <laughs> Well, well, you, you, husband, as old as we are, but he wouldn't even go to the toilet unless he drunk his drink up because you don't know who he's going to... Because someone, you're suggesting someone might spike the drink, yeah, put, yeah, put a drug yeah. in there. Yeah. How, how common is that, do you think, Judith? And it is very common. As I said, I, well, a friend, yes, yeah, she was a friend of a... Yeah, she was a friend. Yeah. I knew the mother. I didn't know the daughter quite yeah. so much. But I knew the mother... And the mother lost a daughter because the daughter went out to the toilet and come back and had a drink. And because, as I said, you don't mention any... Well, I don't, and you're not going to. No. So, um, no. And the poor girl, she was only 18, went out to the loo, mm. come back, drunk a drink up. Yeah, and some... No, I can't, because I can no, swear it. No, 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 someone, no I, someone I, put, I understand that. Someone put something in her yeah, drink. and somebody turned around and spiked it, and I think she, well, she died within, I don't know, a week, yeah, because well. they'd spiked, and well. that's... So I'd well. rather, and everybody's got the right to have a drink, yeah. but why should you just sit at home having a drink and not going out and having a drink? Judith, thank you very much. We've got to move on to get... Um more voices on. Very sad story there. Um, yeah, sorry. Sorry to hear that, Judith. Thank you for your call. 08459 uh, 455 555. Now, when was the last time that you used a phone box? It seems it's becoming more difficult to find one that works or people who use them. BT has told us it's seen a decline in people using payphones since mobile phones were introduced, but it's committed to making payphones more relevant. Our reporter, Gareth Lloyd, has been finding out what you think. I'm in the phone booth, it's a water across the hall. Well, I'm on West Street in Dunstable and I found uh, the first phone box uh, after driving quite a length down the A5 from Heath and Reach to Dunstable. Um, I'm outside the, uh, the Cafe Yum Yum with one of the workers there. Uh, the phone box is sitting outside your restaurant. Have you seen many people, do many people use it? No, I didn't see many people use it. And uh, actually, you look at it, and the handset's been ripped off the... Uh, yeah, the, it's broken. So it's, bro- it's a broken phone box anyway, and just sitting here, unused, and... Uh, yeah. And you okay. carry a mobile phone around with you, do you? Yeah. So you don't need a phone box anymore? I'm not needed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't... I see- think the people not needed, because everybody got... got- Phone. Everyone's got a mobile phone now, yeah. haven't they? Thank you very much. Yeah. So the, the phone box here in uh, West Street, just outside the taxi rank uh, in Dunstable, near the, near the police station, you'd have thought maybe protected a little bit more uh, because so close to the police station. As I walk in here, you can hear the uh, the acoustics change, the echo here, and, uh, yep, the uh, buttons are broken, the, uh, the handset is missing, the uh, cables, the bare ends hanging off of the, uh, the, the wire where the receiver should be. Uh, opposite the Matthew Street uh, phone box. This old thing broken and uh, no spare change in the uh, in the return coin slot. Well, a few steps uh, down the road to uh, the centre of Dunstable along West Street, and there's another phone box, another BT one. Unlike the last one, though, this one actually has a door, and I can go inside close the door behind me and uh, there is a handset this time so good news we've got a handset and uh, if I pick up the handset 
we have a dialing tone, uh, insert coins or insert a credit card, um, is what it's asking me for. So we have one phone box and uh, no spare coins in the change there. So uh, one phone box working along West Street at the moment. Let's see what else I can find. Right, girls, you're, uh, you're walking along uh, High Street North in Dunstable. Last week of school, are you all excited? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. So uh, moving up a year for everyone next year? Was it, is it finishing schools for anyone? Moving up. No, Everyone's yeah. moving up a year. I want to ask you what this is. What's, what do you reckon that is there on the High Street? Telephone box. A telephone box, yeah. Has any one of you ever used it? No. Yeah. You've no. used a telephone box, so yeah. you'd know how to use it. Would you know how to use a telephone box at all? Yeah. Yeah? Do you, would you know yeah. how to use one? Yeah. But you two haven't used one ever before? No. Because you've got mobile phones? No. You've not got a mobile phone? Yeah. You've got one? Yeah. So... What, who did you have to ring? Why did you have to uh, use dad. the phone box? <laughs> were you were you lost or stuck or? Oh, uh, I didn't have any credit, so I used ah, the phone. your phone ran out of credits. Would you know how to reverse the charges in a phone box? No, 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 no. 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 Do you know you can reverse the charges? No, no. How much will it cost to make a call in there? Would any sixty p sixty p it cost you? Really? How much do you think? is that? Do you think that's good. Uh, no. No, that's not a good cost, is it? No. It like 10p. 10p there. <laughs> Guys, right, we'll have a great time at school today, last week. Is it? Is it just board games? Is it bringing in things like that and videos and things? Uh, no. Work. You've got to work still? Yeah. Oh, yeah. bad luck. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've now turned uh, left from West Street onto High Street North, and uh, I am greeted by my third and final phone box. Again, one with a door, and I can go inside, and uh, this phone, we can pick up the handset... And a dialing tone again. So, in uh, in the high streets of uh, West Street and uh, High Street North in Dunstable, uh, we've got two out of three phones working, two with handset. Oh, we seem to have stopped there. Thank you for that, Gareth. I enjoyed that. That report was brilliant for two reasons. All right, first of all, because hearing him inside a phone box... I'd forgotten the effect it can have on your voice. It just sounds, that you know, that kind of slightly echoey sound. And also, Grandad... Grandad Gareth, going asking the kids, do you, your last day of term, do you take in board games and videos? <laughs> it's not 1987. Board games and videos. We used to do that last day of term, board games and videos, but I think it's, you know, they're probably taking in, like, robots and stuff. I don't, I don't really know. Uh, the Ambient Service is considering putting defibrillators in uh, disused phone boxes in Bedfordshire and Hertfordshire, and yesterday we were discussing how many more people, how many people are texting and emailing rather than making phone calls. So would this be a better use for those big red coin boxes? Simon Marshall is Community Partnership Training Officer for East of England Ambulance Service. Good morning, Simon. Good morning, Ian. Why put defibrillators into phone boxes? Well, these phone boxes are generally uh, located in the heart of the community. Everybody knows where their local phone box is, if there's still one there obviously. Um, and having a defibrillator actually in the heart of a, a, a small sort of uh, village um, gives everybody access to it. Um, as the ambulance service we will have um, a list of where defibrillators are placed within these phone boxes. And for somebody who's in cardiac arrest where they've stopped breathing, um, if somebody phones 999 for the ambulance, um, and there's more than one person in the house, we can actually say to that person, is there somebody else in the house? Could they go to such a location? We give them a code. They can then unlock this secure uh-huh. yellow box, grab a defibrillator, bring it back to the house, put it onto the patient, and actually give them a better chance of survival. So it's going to be locked in. I was going to ask, well, surely any little so-and-so could just go and, you know, have a <laughs> night of defibrillating in the park? Yeah, absolutely. It's not quite the case. Right. <laughs> yeah, um, the telephone boxes themselves... Um, they, they house a defibrillator. It's a big yellow box. Right. It's secure. It has its own sort of power supply, um, and it's got, like, a key code on the front of it. Okay. So, basically, you'll be given that key code over the telephone once you've been um, sort of triaged over the phone about the condition of the person that's collapsed. Um, and whoever else is in the household that can actually get to that phone box will be given the code. That person will then run down the road to the phone box, put the code in, open up the actual locked Mm. box and take the defibrillator back to the address where the call's been made. Are there many examples of members of the public using defibrillators? I I always thought that they were kind of, you know, they were in hospitals in the back of ambulances and that's it. Are there any other places where they're available and the public use them? Yeah, we have um, what we call public access defibrillator sites. Um, So, for example... Uh, Luton Airport, they have a number of um, defibrillators situated right. airside and also um, terminal side where people can actually just take them off the wall and use them um, in a cardiac arrest um, event. We also have um, these other 
uh, sort of defibrillators in phone boxes where people in other counties such as Norfolk and Suffolk where they're, they're already in place. Really? Yeah. Wow. Because uh, these these are dangerous bits of kit, aren't they? No. Oh, are they they're not? not? They're not. They're life-saving bits of kit. But they can be dangerous in the wrong hands, I would have thought. I've seen the effect it has. I've seen Quincy. I know what happens. <laughs> well, the thing about the defibrillator is it's actually programmed to um, identify uh, a specific heart rhythm that is right. um, that can be shocked. And if the defibrillator does not pick up that heart rhythm, it will not deliver you a shock. Fire it off. So actually, they are quite safe units, to okay. be fair with you. Um, and so, you know, it's a question of opening the lid and, and following the prompts from the machine. Um, and the Research Council, who, who govern the guidelines for the use of defibrillators, uh, say that anyone can pick up a defibrillator off the wall and use it in a cardiac arrest. Simon, th- thank you for that. How interesting. Things have moved on since diagnosis murder. Simon, thank you for that. That's fascinating. Simon Marshall, uh, Community Partnership Training Officer for East of England Ambulance Service. Beds, hearts and bugs news. BBC Three Counties Radio. It's 8.46 on Thursday, July the 19th. These are the headlines on BBC Three Counties Radio. A Hertfordshire woman has backed her son's decision to refuse a fresh medical test to see if he's fit to be extradited to the USA. Experts say there's a high risk he could kill himself if extradited to America, but ministers want a new report. Five people from London who were arrested this month have been charged with terrorism offences. Three are accused of travelling to Pakistan for terrorism training. One of them is Richard Dart, a 29-year-old who converted to Islam and appeared in a BBC documentary last year. The charges are not related to the Olympic Games. In sport, the Open Golf Championship is underway at Royal Lytham with Buckinghamshire's world number one, Luke Donald, again aiming to win his first major. The weather for beds, hearts and bucks, bright spells at first, but otherwise rather cloudy with the chance of some showery rain developing. Maximum temperature, 18 degrees Celsius. Coming up, we find out what song you voted to be the greatest pop song of all time. We had a text from Gary and Luton about drugs. Uh, anyone who wants to legalise drugs of any sort is a complete muppet. All drugs destroy lives cause intimidation on the streets from dossers hanging about at shops, etc., trying to ponce money and causes crime to find, fund their habits. Even if legalised, you're telling people being in a zombie state is fine. Yes, the government would rake in more tax, but more would be spent by the NHS to deal with related problems caused by drugs. Zero tolerance, seizure of assets and life sentences for dealers should be the way forward. Well, th- th- that's one opinion. There is the argument that if drugs were legal, that's not necessarily what I subscribe to, but if they were legal then you could kind of monitor the the purity of the drugs and you could monitor the aftercare. Well, I don't know. I don't, you know, I'm not particularly sure. Um, let's go to Dennis in Dunstable. Good morning, Dennis. Good morning. Good morning, Dennis. Your t- telephone boxes. Yes, go the on, sir. The last time I used a telephone box was 42 years ago. I beg your pardon? 42 years when ago. When was that, 1969? Yeah, well, I lived in Luton at the time, and I then, straight away, I used, had a phone fitted yeah. into the house, so I never had to go out again. I carry a, um, I carry mobile phones. I'm yeah. not that thick. You got a pocket telephone, yes. Yes, but I it switched off. Well, I only use it. Sw- <laughs> no, no, wait I a minute! You said you're not thick, Dennis. You're supposed to turn it on. No, no, I don't want people calling me on my mobile phone. Good for you. I want. I just want to talk, talk to my wife if I'm out shopping, you know, and I'm, I just ring up and say I'm coming home. Or blah, blah. Oh, Dennis, you've let me down because I was about to say that most calls on mobile phones are insipid and pointless. It's it's calls like. Oh, yeah, I'm out in the car. Um, yeah, I'm on my way home. Yeah, I, I'm, I've just bought some beans. Those calls are pointless. Yeah, but I had a better one than that. I was stood outside my front door and couldn't get in, and I had to... I knocked on the door, and my wife couldn't hear it, so I had to ring with a mobile phone <laughs> yeah, to come and open it let me in. I, I've done that. My father-in-law um, is a doctor, and he's got a mobile phone, and it is, it's so frustrating because it is never turned on. On. We can never get hold of him. Even if we're supposed to be meeting him and he's late or, you know, he could be... We went to a concert with him a while ago. He was half an hour late and we were trying to phone him and his phone was turned off. Yeah. And so we were trying to find out if there was something wrong or not, but there wasn't. But I had a mobile phone when I was young, which was two cocoa tins, a long piece of string. Oh, man, listen, kids these <laughs> days, I used to love that. Get two tins of beans and a piece of string, and that was, that was futuristic walkie-talkie technology. It wasn't, it wasn't very good for long distances. No, but that, you, you couldn't... Ne- oh, man. Uh, Dennis, uh, th- thank you very much for that. That's but- Dennis, who's not used a, a phone box since 1969. That's incredible, <laughs> isn't it? I find that amazing. Let's go to uh, Jane in Aylesbury. Good morning, Jane. Hello, Tim. 
Uh, it, it's Ian, but never mind. Sorry, I'm That's sorry. That's all right. I don't, I don't mind. Sorry. Tim Tim is fine. <laughs> I, I don't like the name Ian because it's got too many vowels in it and no hard <laughs> letters. And Tim's got a nice hard T at the start. <laughs> what can sorry I do for that. you? What can I do for you, Sarah? Jane. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> yes, touche. What can I do for you, Jane? <laughs> Telephone boxes are necessary. Yep. Because I was um, taken to the hospital. I had no money with me. I had to use a... Um, the one at the hospital, which um, I had to I reverse the charge on to get hold of my parents. Yeah. So I've got nobody at home. Um, and they sh- if they're outside, they should be painted a colour that you can see. Glass ones are no good. You right. can't see them. Yeah. And I definitely think they're necessary. Because if you, if you haven't got enough money on your phone, or your battery dies, and you've got to make a phone call, you need to make a... But yeah. how often does that happen, Jane, really? Well, um... When was the last time you, you were in that situation and you had to use a phone box? Not very often, but about... It was about a month ago the last okay. time I used a phone box. Who did you phone from a phone box, if you don't mind me asking? I had to phone my mum. Right. I was in hospital. Right. Um, oh, of course, you did. Yes, it was, uh, that, yeah. that was the last time. OK. Yeah. All right. Interesting. Uh, Jane, thank you very much for that. OK. There um, we go. It's, it's, it, the, the red phone boxes you don't see anymore. There are a few in London... But that's it. You don't really see many, do you? And they're kind of... Uh, well, they are iconic. But they, they're going. You don't see them. You get them in pubs now. How much do they cost? You can buy them. You can probably buy them on eBay. Uh, I bet they cost a fortune. Absolute fortune. If you've got one in your back garden, as some people do, you've got about five minutes to give me a call. 08459 455 555. Now, this morning, we have been deciding... Uh, what is the best pop song of all time? And although it's, you know, it's, it's not particularly scientific, this is what we're sticking to. Your decisions. You have been calling and texting in your favourites. And before I reveal your top five, let's talk to a man who knows a thing or two about music. Uh, Jonathan Wingate is a music journalist. Good morning, Jonathan. Morning, Ian. Uh, what makes a good pop song? Mm, how long have we got to debate this? Do you know what? We can, I can talk all day. J- Jonathan can wait. We can talk all day. <laughs> Um, what makes a good pop song? Perfect melody, mm. possibly something that annoys you. It's got to be shiny, maybe a bit sexy, exuberant, and completely memorable and hummable. And that's the problem with pop music at the moment, is that a lot of the songs you hear in the charts don't really have the tune that sticks in your head. And maybe the personality behind but it. But now, listen, because I think that, but is that because... No. <laughs> no, I'm going to say it, Jonathan. I've got. Yeah, I, no. I, I have to. Is that because we are two old men and pop music isn't for us? Pop music is for thirteen-year-old girls, no, isn't it? Of course it? it is. Me. Of course it is. But pop music, by its very nature, is ephemeral, so it comes and goes very quickly, and that's what it should do. But the best pop music it eventually lands up sticking around like a bad smell. Mm. So you know that's why you have the same music again and again and again. But I, I you know, I've been in the business a long time and. I do think a lot of it's been done before. There are only 12 notes yep. in music. And so how many combinations, it's about the combinations of those notes, that, um, yeah, what you do with the combinations of those notes uh, that makes a great pop song. Hence the Bee Gees and ABBA and the Beatles and the Kinks and all the best pop well, music. You but then you've got Rihanna, you know, and yeah. that, that's brilliant pop music. Yeah. So we are, there is still good pop music being of made. Of course but there is, of course there is. Do, um, do you think, you see, saying that it's about, you know, what you do with those 12 notes, is that why bands like the Beatles have lasted so long? Just because they kind of got there first. They were the sort of first generation that had proper electric guitars and proper amplification. So they were always going to last, weren't they? No, I mean, I think the Beatles is a sort of ex- a red herring because you, there you've got three genius pop writers. So ostensibly they're the modern day equivalent of Beethoven, Mozart, Bach, Chopin the best melodists of all time. Mm. So the Beatles really were that good. Mm. Um, and, you know, there's a, reason, there's a reason people are still listening to that music. I should imagine Brianna people will still be listening to that. Certainly Umbrella, they'll be still listening to that in ten years. But everything else seems... I think the, it, 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 everything else seems so quick-moving and disposable. And I think half of the problem is um, everything is so ephemeral now that nothing has a chance to really stick beyond the target market, which is 13, 14 year old uh, Mm. kids. And, you know, that's the problem. The other thing, interesting thing is, of course, people are snobby about it and they think in terms of rock and roll or classical music, and people get very snobby about pop music, but it's actually very, very, very difficult to write a great pop. Of course it is. And you look at the Bee Gees, 
um, you know, perfect pop music, yeah. jive talking. How do you do that? Ultimately, it's it's almost impossible to say how you do that. In the case of jive talking, the Bee Gees did that because they were travelling back and forth every day um, along the, uh, this bridge in Miami, and they got that clickety click yeah. along the uh, thing with the rivets of the, uh, what do you call those things? The, the rivets. Know, the I'm gonna, yeah. steel rivets yeah. along the thing, and it went... And that was Jive Talking. Well, that the, the, the Monkeys rhythm. theme. Genius. The Monkeys theme was, was written because it was the two songwriters who were walking down the street and they needed to come up with a theme song and it was the beat of them walking down the street and they well, got it the from same that. Thing, isn't it? It's How, perfect. What, what, a, what a great story. I didn't know that. It's true. Listen, didn't, I'm going to you know. play you our top five as uh, voted for by the listeners and you can let me know what you think afterwards. Have a listen to this. I don't care. Will you do the fandango? Thunderbolt and lightning, very, very frightening me. Galileo, 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 Galileo Magnifico! Sleepy, Should have been number one. I'm disappointed, very disappointed. And the last song is the Scissor Sisters. I don't feel like dancing. What do you reckon to those, Jonathan? Uh, it's a pretty good list. <laughs> I, I wouldn't have had Laura Branigan in there. I have to say, <laughs> I know that was um, an unusual one. Uh, and my, I mean, the Monkeys is is impeccable, isn't it? Oh, it's, but, it's wonderful. I mean, no Abba, no Bee Gees. It's a bit of a worry. It's, what it, was the first one? Was that the Jacksons? It was the Jacksons' Walk Right Now, which I'd never that's heard before. Odd, but yeah, that's an odd choice. We had a lot it? of people c- calling in for it. I would have had something off the wall. From off the From wall, off the wall right. yes, I suppose that. Jonathan, listen, I've got to go because we're running out of time. Uh, we, we, let's get Jonathan on the show again because I could talk to him for ages. Absolutely ages. Thank you very much there. Uh, that's Jonathan Wingate, who is a music journalist. Well, those were your top five pop songs. You chose them. Don't blame me. Oh, hang on a second. Now, now Radio Man has crashed here at my side of the, uh, the thing as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to try and click on this and see if we can get the travel bed. No, we can't. So I'm going to go straight to Sophie Tyler and get the latest on the road. Sorry, Sophie, we haven't got any music. You'll have to do Acapulco. <laughs> That's all right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sophie. And you did it superbly without the, uh, the need of music in the background, which is always good news to hear. This has been... Oh, look, music's coming in behind me. Wonderful. That's Jonathan Vernon-Smith who's doing that. That's how good he is. Uh, I'll be back tomorrow morning uh, at six o'clock with your breakfast show. Thank you so much for taking part. It's lovely to have you calling in. Stick around because Jonathan Vernon-Smith is asking about security at the Olympics. I'll hand over to him now. Getting beds, hearts and bugs talking. This is BBC Three Counties Radio.